Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Call the meeting to order. As I tuck my badge away. <laughs> okay. If we'll all bow our heads, I have the invocation. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you guide us, direct us. We have very complicated issues. We have issues that we all must consider carefully. And we pray that you direct us throughout these deliberations. Please bless this county, this state, and this country. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have a motion as to the agenda? Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. I'm going to apologize in advance. Um, we have one single speaker, and I cannot read this handwriting. Uh, it looks like Walker, possibly, last name. Yes, sir. I, 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 your handwriting's as bad as mine. <laughs> okay. It's about the landfill. I don't think we have anything on the agenda for that, so you'll be at the last of the meeting. Yeah, I'm usually that. Okay. Did you bring your dinner? That's the next question. Did you bring your dinner? So did you bring your dinner? It's going to be a while. Mr. Chairman. Hey, you note that his it'll be a while did not get a second. <laughs> okay. Uh, do we have a um, motion as to the agenda? Mr. Chairman, there was, there, there was a, I think there was a someone who might want to speak. I don't know if that the, the gentleman yes, would. Yes, I was told I needed to sign, and I was told I didn't need to sign to speak. You know, but I want to speak on something on what, the agenda. Tonight. What is your topic? Uh, friendship, friendship Adult Day Services. All right, uh, that is on our docket. Um, Madam Attorney, can we make an exception? I know that's a bad, bad, bad policy, but since he's here at the first of the meeting, should we allow him to speak? I misunderstood. I spoke with him. I thought he was here for the public hearing, so that's my fault. Okay. Uh, <laughs> since it's our fault, please come forward. Okay, I'll be brief. Uh, thank you all for now it's the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Steve Smith, and this is my son, Justin and he attends Friendship Adult Day Services and I'm a single parent so he's been going there for 19 years except for the last two because of COVID and had Friendship not been open I wouldn't have been able to work and he would have had to be or I would have he'd have had to be in a home and then in order for me to work so um, like I say the place is a really good place for the citizens of Alamance County that need it uh, like I say, there's a lot of challenges that go with having a special needs uh, son or daughter. And I've had a lot of blessings and things to help me along the way. And Friendship Adult Day Services is one of them. And um, as many challenges as I have, I know there's people that go there that have a lot more challenges than I do. But I would ask that y'all seriously consider when Friendship comes up later on tonight. And if you hadn't been there, I would encourage you to go there visit it and see what you will be helping 
should you decide to help them. And uh, like I say, um, it's a wonderful place. It's been a godsend for me, and uh, without it, uh, I'd have been in a lot of trouble the last 17 years being able to work and to have my son live with me. We thank you. But that's about all I have to say. But thank you very much for your time. Yes, sir. And go Tar Heels. Say <laughs> like, go Tar Heels. Tar Heels. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank y'all. Now, I'll have to object to the Tar Heel versus Wake Forest. <laughs> don't, let that, don't let that influence you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Do we have a, uh, as to the consent agenda? Motion to approve. Second. I'll second it. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous passage. Thank you. Okay. Tanya Cattle. So she, she will be joining by Zoom tonight. All right. We do not want her here. Okay. Uh, That's not very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so for the item, I'm just here at the meeting, so we're on the heavy industrial item number, right, 7.1? Yes. Yes. Okay, so for the item 7.1, you all have some information in your packets. Bruce is probably momentarily projecting the one-page presentation. Uh, what you all discussed last month is currently the Unified Development Ordinance in the land Heavy industrial land use section shows a 1,200 linear foot land spacing class three requirement. There was quite a bit of public input of requesting a 2,000 linear foot. Uh, staff agrees with 24 to 1,500 linear feet is adequate. Um, after looking at everything and just kind of reevaluating what the most distance would be comfortable for staff. Came to the number of 1,750 linear feet would be the maximum land spacing uh, allowed or recommended by staff that would work for just the class three to so not make any suggested changes to the other classes. Is that it? I, I that's it for Mom. Yeah, let's have a question. I think that's her presentation, and then we'll go into public hearing. Excellent. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, can I make a comment? Yes, sir. I wanted to make it clear my question in our last meeting about the 2,000 foot setback that had was not an indication of an interest in trying to propose a 2,000 foot setback. I just couldn't quite figure out why. We had two different opinions from different attorneys, and if we ever resolved it, found out that the other attorneys had not responded to us, and so that solved it as far as I was concerned. So I thank our attorneys for getting that cleared up. All right. We need a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, it's unanimous. We are now in the public hearing phase. Do we have speakers as to this item? Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you, and uh, my name is Linda Lee, and I live at 2639 Tobacco Road, Snow Camp. Um, is that L-E-E? -E? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, real quick, um, I would like to thank the planning board for increasing the land spacing setback to 1,750 feet. Uh, why do we need to set back land spacing for class three heavy development. The previous setback for 1,500 feet was not sufficient considering the potential conflict with other land uses such as agricultural, residential, schools, and other small business owners in our community. In addition, a 1,750 foot setback will provide our community for increased protection from large heavy use industries that will only care about their profits. We are already seeing this in the disingenuous methods and elements aggregates, such as operating without a county permit, 
operating outside at agreed hours so the neighbors are unable to enjoy their evenings and weekends without hearing blasting, grinding, and constant rolling trucks. I support the 1,700 foot setback uh, feet spacing because it better serves the growth for our community for small scale commercial development and residential development. Heavy use industry has no place in snow camp and will take away the character of our community. Yes, change is approaching, but it's the citizens of Snow Camp who have the right to how <clears throat> have the right how this change will look while protecting historical sites and a rural character. Snow Camp has great potential. It's a community, but not, for not allowing not allowing from the 17 foot 1750 foot setback for land use, it will put this in jeopardy. Keeping a previous smaller setback, 1,500 feet, will only al will allow a small enough gap for, to have a devious big money corporation or investment firm come in and buy three, four, 500 acres and more and set up a nice heavy use industry. The 1,750 feet setback will close this gap. This is only the beginning for increasing protection for our rural community of Snow Camp. We will continue to speak out and, and up. I support the 1,750 set, foot setback to protect our citizens of our community, the community's growth, and its rural character, and the important historical sites. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers on this side? Any speakers on this side? Okay, are there any other speakers? And there's nobody in the... No, right. Okay, do we have a motion to close the... Uh, so moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Okay. Now, the question is, do we want to take a vote on it? I think I could support 1500. I think 1750 is a little much. Any other discussion? Question for Ms. Cattle. Please. Ms. Cattle, did you say that the uh, that the planning department supports the 1500 foot setback? Yes, you do. Staff supports the 1500. Uh, we're very comfortable with that number. And what what was the vote of the planning board on the uh, was it 1500? as well? Yes, sir. 1,500 is what they unanimously voted on. Unanimous? Yes. 15 or 17, 50. She said 15. No, 15. That's the reason I made them. I mean, I, I think I support what you're saying, Mr. Chairman. I mean, 1,500 foot is, it's over a quarter of a mile, mm -hmm. which seems to me to be a pretty significant setback. So I'd, I'd support the 1,500. Okay. I'll make the motion. Do you, are you making a second? Yes. Any other discussion? All in favor, signify um, by saying aye. Point of order. I'm oh, sorry. Please. Uh, I think that you'll need to make the motion in the form of the consistency statement. It's uh, 7-1-B in your packet. I'm glad you brought that up. I was curious. Thank sorry. you. But I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It may have been the last page in the 7-1, but it's 7-1-B is what we're looking for. It is. The Alameda County Board of Commissioner hereby finds, and this is my motion, I suppose, uh, that the proposed amendments to the Alameda County Unified Development Ordinance are consistent with the Alameda County Land Development Plan as adopted. Specifically, the Alameda County Board of Commissioners finds that the Alamance County Land Development Plan directs the county, one, to promote flexibility in development ordinances, two, to develop conscious strategies for a proactive managing the type of growth that is consistent with the county's overall vision and goals. Furthermore, the Board of Commissioners finds the proposed amendments are necessary to remove ambiguous and conflicting language within the existing ordinance. 
Therefore, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners recommends the approval of the proposed amendment to the Alamance County Unified Development Ordinance. And that is my motion. Second. Question. Who was was the planning department proposing the 1750 and the planning board proposing the 1500? Yes, sir. Okay. I, I think that Ms. Cattle may have misunderstood the question. I think when you asked, I think she was saying the planning department could live with 1500. Their, the planning department's recommendation was 1750. The planning board's recommendation was 1500. Well, my motion is 1500. Yes. Can I just ask a quick question? Surely. Has it always been 1500 no, or been did it go up to 1200 okay, so it's 12 and it went to 15. Mm -hmm. so now 15 to 1750. no if right it was 12 my motion is to make it 15. Okay. any other questions statements comments did the planning department have any um reasoning for wanting 1750 as composed to 12. What was, the, what was their difference? What was their thing like this would be so much better or what? Ms. Kelly, so when we, heard, we heard the discussion at last month's meeting from the public desiring to be as much as 2,000 linear feet. We just went back and did an evaluation on where our maximum comfort level would be. 1750 would be the maximum would be comfortable. 1,500 were very comfortable with that. So you guys were kind of willing to meet everybody halfway. Mm -hmm. Right. It's the planning board, not the planning department. Right. Or who's recommending what? Any other comments? I'll ask Thomas. Who's recommending what? <laughs> so the planning board is recommending 1500 The planning department is comfortable with 1750 but she said she they could go along with 1500. She, she's fine with 1500 as well. I think 1750 was her max that the, uh, the planning department was comfortable with. And the motion on the table and with a second is 1500, pursuant to the motion that I just read. Any other discussion or comments? All well, in favor? Did, actually didn't have the. Uh, Finally. Yeah, you didn't put the. You didn't. I added 1500 to my motion. And Mr. Turner, I assume you approve that amendment? Yes. Thank you. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. <clears throat> and thanks for the point of order. <laughs> Okay, uh, Scattle, you're up again. Yes, sir. I think Bruce is going to be pulling up the um, presentation for the next item. If y'all just tell me when that's up. It's up. Thank you. Okay, so on page one, we're just going to run through. This is the RV slash um, Travel Trailer Park Ordinance. This is a section of the ordinance that would go into the Unified Development Ordinance should it be passed. Tanya. So it would be section 6.14. Uh, page one here shows you we've Tanya. got some language that we've added Tanya. in. And Tanya. Yes. I think Natalia. Um, Tanya, could you explain your first, the first page where you have proposed changes to the UDO, where you explain the the legend, like the highlighted text, the strike through text? That's what we see on the screen. Would you mind explaining that to everyone? Absolutely. So the highlighted text is language that we're adding to the ordinance as part of the proposed text amendment. That is for it, the sections that we're changing that it already exists. Now there are parts of it that are not highlighted. They're just brand new text for the whole section of 6.14. So that is not highlighted, but that is all new text. And then you have the red strike through, and those are things where we're actually removing existing text. So we want to make that clear that that's a removal. And then the bold and italic text. This is language that after planning board voted, legal and staff got together based on the amendments that the planning board made and we cleaned up and clarified a little bit of language just to make it easier to read. It did not change any substance to what the planning board voted on and passed for their tax amendment for these ordinances. All right, next page. 
you're going to see section 6.7.4. This actually falls in a mobile home park section. We wanted to give some clarity and some extension to the ability for mobile home parks to uh, exist and expand. So you'll see we've added the text. The additional text is in bold and italic. The planning board voted and then this was um, the language that they voted on and we regrouped just a little bit at staff level. For it to say, currently it says existing manufactured home parks shall be considered legal non-conforming subject to section 3.2. 3.2 is the non-conforming section in the entire unified development ordinance. We added to that of this ordinance except section 3.2.3, discontinuation of non-conforming use. Discontinuation of non-conforming use in manufactured home parts is governed by section 6.7.5. So that it would be very clear that only 3.2.3 of section 3.2, there's probably six sections in 3.2, is the only part we're willing or wanting right now to make any extra comment on. So 6.7.5, You'll see there, the red strike through is what planning board actually voted on and we took that language meaning the same thing that they voted on and add the italicized just for clarity. But if a non-conforming manufactured home park for any reason discontinued the use of a park for one year during 65 days or more, such use may not resume until permits are obtained and all of the requirements of the ordinance are met for purposes of this section. So. We scratched through what the planning board wrote, but for clarity, it says for purposes of this section, this continued use takes place when not a single habitable manufactured home remains on a lot of a park. In such cases, the entire park would be discontinued and no longer be used as a manufactured home park. So for just kind of a little bit of background, the 3.2 section gives any non-conforming use across the county 180 days to stay there once they're discontinued the 180 days comes into effect if you hit one day 181 you will then have to come under new ordinance we um, did some research and we were hearing that there was taking quite a bit of time for mobile home manufactured home uh, builders to get these things done in 180 days and in fact it does take almost that full 180 days to get a new home from a manufacturer then you have to get, get it into the process of going to environmental health and getting your well of septic straight and then come into the planning and inspections and getting permits and set up. Setups used to take less than a month, now they're taking more than that. So when adding all that together, planning felt like there's uh, no reason not to extend it 180 days to something more reasonable. 365 days felt like a good number that would cover any need to get new manufactured homes in these manufactured home parts and everybody would be continuing to use them as they always have. That is the only changes to the manufactured home section. I don't know, probably should take questions now on that before we move into the RV section. I know, I know we have had several mobile home park owners here and like yes, the next thing too for the RVs that had really expressed interest in sitting down with the planning board and just kind of talking this out in a round table. Did you guys meet with any of the home owners so to speak while the planning board was meeting was there any kind of conversation open like that we have had one meeting with park owner and their attorney as well um, that they requested okay. any other questions prior to the public hearing well this is just we're just going over the first section right now yeah got it All right, well, we can move on to the next section if everybody's good with that. So I meant as to that section. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, Bruce, if we can go down to page 121, where it starts section 6.14, recreation vehicles slash travel trailer parks. You let me know when we get there. We are on page 121. Awesome, thank you. So I'm going to go over the highlights of what this RV ordinance actually entails. For the infrastructure part, the roads, the watershed, things like that, this duplicates the manufactured home park section. But for the other portions, that's what I'd like to cover. 
Um, on the first part here, you'll see the, the minimum lot size, space size for RVs in these RV parks is 2,400 square feet. That's um, remarkably smaller. A manufactured home park, 30,000 square feet is a standard. It could go down to as low as 8,000 square feet with water and sewer. That's very unlikely in the county. We have very few areas that could actually access water and sewer. So this is a substantial size change compared to what manufactured home parks and or subdivisions have. They are the same at 30,000 square feet and can go as low as 8,000. Uh, next page. You'll see on this page, we've got some road standards which don't differ largely from manufactured home parks, excluding that number one, RV park shall have a clear way of 60 feet. Traditionally, we've had a 50 foot clear way, but as other agencies have change their guidelines and things, the 60 foot has become more of a common uh, number and the 50 foot doesn't really work most of the time. So we're gonna go ahead and move forward with the 60 foot so we're more in compliance with other agencies that would also be reviewing these parks. Uh, on the bottom of the page, you'll see a space frontage, uh, minimum of 40 foot on the travelway. And then you've got two parking places per spot, which is a statement as a manufactured home park. Um, next page. So in this section, you'll have setbacks. Your first primary setback is minimum distance of 15 feet between structures on adjacent lots. Uh, your property line setback, which is your external property line for the whole parcel, is a 50 foot setback. And that, with, you come in that 50 foot and that's where you can start your RV park lots. The landscape buffer is a 30 foot landscape buffer and there's more detail lower, but it's a two row stagger tree landscaping buffer requirement, and that can go within that 50 foot setback. Um, along all public right of ways, there's a minimum, foot, minimum setback of 40 foot. And then there's still the landscaping of 30 foot. It gives you more uh, detail about what you're looking for in that and why it's there. Um, screening is also part of this within the 50 foot um, public right of way shall be screened from view for the public road with a buffer as defined by this ordinance. Again, that's the two staggered rows. Next page. Uh, we had several comments from planning board members and um, citizens when we were going through this ordinance that some visuals would be very helpful. So we drew in some visuals for this um, part of our ordinance. It's never been done, but very helpful. So you see the dark black line is the parcel line. The dashed black line is your setback line. And then your landscape buffer is actually in between. So it shows you that all the landscaping is before you get to the setback where your actual lots would start. And then you have the house within a thousand feet. There's language in here that says, if you can still see, do the contours or something, still see um, the part from uh, adjacent home, then there's additional landscaping that could be done. And then the land spacing towards the middle of the page, that is not landscaping, but land spacing, which is very similar to what you all just talked about with the heavy industry. Land spacing here is handled depending on how many units you're in. Three to seven unit for a park is a 25 foot land spacing. Eight to 12 is 50 foot and 13 or more is a hundred foot land spacing. So by definition, no park may be located in any direction from an existing manufactured home or RV park, community parks, shared by the community, school, church, or residence, except for the residence of the owner. And that's where this land spacing comes from. So beyond the existing property line of the park, you go outward, just like the um, heavy industry. And then you go as much as 150 feet outward and if there's a home or something there, then that has to be worked with and dealt with. Uh, most times will be through the variance process. Uh, signage for these types of developments are the same as mobile home parks. Next page. Uh, still have a requirement of garbage disposal, uh, water sewer disposal. And then um, in the RV park section I here, it's one space may be used for a manufactured home for an administrator of the park with space meeting the minimum requirement required in the manufactured home park requirements. So it allows you to have somebody that would kind of oversee the park and they would be able to be in a mobile home, manufactured home instead of an RV. Uh, that seemed to be pretty important along the way. So we want to make sure that was included. 
the approval and permitting is still very similar, excluding that now every two years you, they have to re-up this permit, which means a field inspection is done by staff. And if there are any kind of violations outstanding, then that can come back to the boards for approval to say that that particular park could continue to operate or not. But the two year renewal is not something that's in the manufactured home park section of the ordinance right now. This would be specific to RV parks. Uh, next page. All right, so the cluster developments again are not permitted uh, with RV parts. And then you've got site plan requirements, which are very, very similar to the mobile home park section as well. Next page. This last section, 6.14.4, expansion to existing development. Uh, for clearance purposes, staff and legal have pulled together language here, and it says existing RV or travel trailer parts, which were approved under the prior manufactured home park ordinance, shall be considered legal non conforming subject to section 3.2 of this ordinance. So you all know there's been just probably three that were. Uh, RV parts that were approved on the manufactured home park ordinance simply because currently a manufactured home park ordinance allows for RVs to be in it and they had come to you all for some variances on lot sizes, street widths, those kind of things. So those are the ones we would be talking about as existing under previous approvals. Uh, next page. You'll see on this page there's definitions is the section we're in now for cleanup where we're adding uh, we are striking light duty truck. Uh, in the next page, you'll see that we're taking that wording out of the RV travel trailer section so that we don't have to define or keep up with updating a light duty truck definition just for the purposes of pulling an RV. Uh, next page. You'll see here we have an existing manufacturer home definition, and in that definition, it says travel trailers, campers, or motorhomes, or any other transport transportable structure with or without permanent foundation being used as a residence with an approved manufactured home park shall, and we've added the word not, be considered a manufactured home. That language will be picked up in our definition of RV and travel trailer. So by taking that and putting not in there, manufactured home parks will only have manufactured homes and then RV parks will only have RVs for any new approvals. Next page. The very bottom of this page, you'll see recreational vehicle, RV, travel trailer definition. A vehicle which is built on a chassis, on a single chassis, 400 square feet or less when measured at the largest horizontal projection, designed to be self propelled or permanently towable. And that definition actually goes into the next page as well. And then D, designed permanently not for use as a permanent dwelling, but as a temporary living quarters for recreation, camping, travel, or seasonal use and is fully licensed and ready for highway use. Tiny homes and part models that do not meet these item, meet the items listed above are not considered recreational vehicles and should meet the standards to be permitted as residential structures. That language is actually going to come straight pretty much verbatim out of your building code language and that's we want to make sure that we're all saying the same thing and we don't have problems issuing permits on planning <coughs> work for the building inspections. So as well on that page, you have recreational vehicle, RV, travel trailer, park. <coughs> and that is as related to a park comprised of three or more recreational vehicles, RVs or travel trailers in one tract of land, regardless of whether or not a fee is charged to occupy, occupy the land. And then RV to park space, the portion of land in a recreational vehicle, travel trailer, park allotted to or designed for accommodations of one recreational vehicle travel trailer. So it's one unit per lot is what they're, we're trying to get at by that definition. I would say that is the conclusion of my presentation. Should anybody have questions, I'll be glad to take those. I have one question. Um, under recreational vehicle, RV, trailer, travel trailer, yes, yeah, single chassis. You mean single axle, is that what you're trying to say? I believe that's what the intention was. Like I said, I pulled this out of um, more of the building code side, and they probably haven't even completely updated that to be more common words. I know that a lot of uh, motorhomes, particularly, have uh, double axles. Uh, right. I would. Why are you limited to single axle? 
we're pulling this out of building code because if we differ our definition by building code, then what can be permitted at these sites may vary greatly, and then we have a conflict between two departments in the county. I'm not a big NASCAR fan, but when I go to NASCAR races, I see a lot of motorhomes that have dual axles. Uh, okay. Are you trying to eliminate all of those? What's your purpose? It's, we're really not. I think the square footage is more of the piece that would be accommodating uh, what units are going in there. So if, if y'all wish to change that language, that is fine. We can come to you during the public comment portion. Okay. Um, Hidden Lake Campground on Highway 54, that's a campground, so that is not an RV park, or is it? Or what name did you say? Did you say Cranmore Meadows? Hidden Lake Campground on Highway 54, yeah. that's, um, they got, well, it's a big pond, but it's a lake. It's and, a um, and you have campgrounds there, but that's not an RV park, according to this, correct? Or is it? As far as I know, no, that would not be something we've permitted like that. Okay, just one question. I, I read all of these restrictions, and like I've got this little monopoly looking house over here, something about a thousand feet, and then I mean, landscaping, if the thousand foot house don't like it, you have to go back and do some more landscaping. Um, are we really wanting these in the county or are we like making so many restrictions to give the impression that we don't? Just help me because if I'm, I would think we don't. I'm we're trying to accommodate the use. It's become quite popular, at least in North Carolina. However, we do know that these densities are incredibly dense compared to anything else that we have on record or any other ordinances that we have. So we want to make sure even though they're here, that they're not a nuisance and not invasive to the people that are coming into to be around that at 2400 square foot lots compared to 30,000 square foot lots and they're transient anyway they're meant to come in and out on a regular basis that can produce noise and other nuisances for the neighbors so we're just trying to allow them in but also protect the ones that would be living around them as to not alter their lifestyle too much either Okay, but these are going to be human beings Single. in these RVs, right? Because yes. the way it sounds is That's what I ask her. they can't be a nuisance, they can't make any noise, they don't want to, I mean, what is, what is moving in? I mean, where are these people coming from that are, are so, I, I'm just asking Tanya because um, there's all kind of different places to live that meet all kind of different incomes and lifestyles and families and all that. And I just don't want our county to come across, and I'm sure it isn't, it's just me thinking that we don't want you people <laughs> living here with your nuisance and your loud noise, because it kind of reads that way. I'm, I'm just asking, because there's a lot of negative adjectives going along with those people. You know, I heard that with rezoning in, in the schools. I don't want my kid going to school with those people. I'm thinking, you know, we're all those people any day of the week. I'm just, I'm just asking a question. No, I don't think we're reaching out for those people, but the type of use of uh, pulling campers in and out and the density of surely how many people and how many units will sit on an acre of land compared to only one on an acre of land for a single family residential, just protecting that kind of use. The density alone brings its own nuisances uh -huh. and noise and traffic and things that are not, wouldn't have ordinarily been there with any other use. Okay. Give me a definition for single. Well, first of all, I kind of agree with Pam to a lot of other people. We are those people, right, Pam? I am those people at least three days <laughs> late. We are those people. Um, I, and I've got a question about the, the single axle issue as well. I mean, uh, these are businesses which pay taxes, will collect sales taxes, um, provide a service to the traveling community. Um, I know a lot of people travel with mo with their motorhomes and with their uh, in their RVs and look for places to uh, park overnight and then hit the road again the next day. So I, I can't see any reason to try and block it. But I agree with what uh, Mr. Uh, Paisley said as well. I'm wondering why we're saying we're if single chassis means um, 
single axle, we're reducing, I don't know how big, how many square feet are in a double axle RV. Uh, I don't know if there's somebody here who might know, have a better idea of that. I see a hand going up. Um, uh, we'll have some time for public comments. Uh, I can't see, you know, I, I can't see why we would want to limit them to single axle. But that section can be struck. I think the rest of it has enough of definition there where we can understand what we should and should not have in there should anybody ask. Beg your pardon? We could strike A and keep B, C, and D and still have the intent of the definition there and B not have the single chassis language on there. Mr. Uh, Lashley just looked up uh, single axle or single chassis versus tandem ch chassis and I think I was right I think in that and would, would you approach please sir yes sir uh, I know know you and, and know you well, have I'm information a, I'm a avid RV camper so just talking about the size of RVs fifth wheels now go up to about 40 foot 43 foot in length and they're eight to eight and a half foot wide mm -hmm. so do the math and that's getting close to 400 square feet um, and they have two axles. When you get something that large, it has to have two right. axles. Years ago, they didn't have them that big because they didn't have trucks to pull them. Now they make F-250s, 450s, whatever, that will pull a big RV. Motorhomes come up to 54 feet. They're a little bit wider. So you might get over that 400 square foot. So. And they also can be dual axle. They can be triple axle. Yeah. Okay. They cannot be cheap. Mm -mm. No. no. Oh, yeah. No. Those people ain't cheap. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's a good idea to strike the 400 square feet in the single chassis or single axle in that language. Legal department, should we send this back to planning for clarification or should we make the motion on our own? The Board of Commissioners has authority and power to strike provisions and make the decision on your own. You're not required to send it back to planning. Is there it's a your, recommendation that we, we send it back or not? It's, in t it's up to the Board of Commissioners. All right. If that's the only provision, then it seems pretty simple to address in front of the Board of Commissioners. Board, before we go into a public hearing, um, do we want to table this and send it back to planning or do we want to have the public hearing and then make a decision i'd, I'd be very a full-time job so well i'd be very interested in the public comments mr chair oh I, I absolutely i don't yeah. think we need to delete that yeah don't we just delay I, any, any further discussion until after public comments I'm, I'm good with that the rest of the board yes. i just think it's funny because i grew up in a mobile home and and now tiny homes, as we know where I stand with tiny homes, they're so cute and warm and fuzzy, but all these other things are cute and warm and fuzzy, and they just got a set of wheels on them. It amazes me how we treat the mobile home things like the stepsister compared to the tiny home is the, I, I don't know, it's just, it's just amazing. I was looking at a magazine today and see all these granite countertops with these tiny homes in the loft, and I thought, <laughs> People going to pay because there's TV shows about, you know, I thought if I had a tiny home, I'd have to have a warehouse to put my stuff in because I couldn't get rid of all my shoes. I've never seen anything like it. But it just, I, it just amazes me how our mindsets, we can be real quick to think one thing's cute and the other is nuisance, must have a buffer, must have a barrier, landscape. I don't know, just stuff like that strikes me as kind of funny. Well, all you have to do is go shopping for an RV, and you'll find out there's no such, there's no term in there anywhere about cheap. Well, those people can't afford a house that costs the size of both my house. Wheels or no wheels. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, if I may, I have some a couple of fundamental questions for Ms. Cuddle that I think might be good to have before the public hearing and Excellent. that might That's inform it. Here. Um, Ms. Ms. Cuddle, what's the rationale for having uh, the number of RVs that even bring you into the ordinance at three? Well, so originally that was the same language as what's in the manufacturing uh, parts, and that's the language they felt like one just really wasn't enough to constitute an actual park or make anybody do any upgrades to get it to a park level. And that's three on one piece of property regardless of how far apart they're spaced? That's right. Um, 
and what's the rationale for for the recreational vehicle park land spacing based on three to seven, eight to twelve, and thirteen and above? Because they're, they're um, different. The I'm sorry. The board was interested in doing a tiered section. It actually started out as five different tiers, and as they discussed and talked a little more, they decided to break it down just to three. That uh, over a dozen seemed like a lot of traffic and a lot more coming and going, so the land spacing would be more. Uh, less than the eight or so, they felt like was a small enough uh, use and enough small enough traffic and everything that the land spacing could be less. So they wanted to stair step it up or down, then you look at that, depending on how many are there because the, the use and the density and things mattered a whole lot to what spacing they needed. And then it's kind of fundamentally, what's, what's I've never seen a land use ordinance before that, and maybe just because I just haven't experienced it enough, that where, where the use of my property is affected by the use and of somebody else's property based upon the proximity of that use to my use. Is that is, is that a new concept or is it is it something I just haven't thought about before? So we use the word land spacing, but a lot of uh, ordinances use just distance from, and we have some of that in some of our ordinances, and just distance from another same type of use or single family residential, they'll do that a thousand foot or something within a straight line from the external property line. So we use the word land spacing, the same concept that a lot of others are using, just calling it distance from. Okay. Um, is there anything that defines the, the landscaping buffers that I have to use? So there's language in the back of the ordinance. It gives you a list of the opportunities for the different trees, and it tells you how you need to stagger them. They're eight foot apart on center from each other. So your first row, goes in eight foot apart and your second row is staggered behind it so that um, you have kind of opposites closing in the landscaping buffer. But we have some language in the rear for that. Is it, is it in what's presented? I just didn't see it. It's not in what's presented. It's just existing landscaping buffer language that we use for solar farms and other things. So the landscaping buffer language is already in the ordinance. That's why I didn't add that in tonight. And then the other, last part is that in the landscaping buffer, definition in the chart it talks about that there may be required additional screening from view if, if you've got the park boundary within a thousand feet and visible from schools churches or residences who determines when it is required and when it's not required that language was put in to give the director discretionary because it depends on contours slopes of land those kind of things so it's very it's it would be site specific to each site so it's given to the director to do that. And I guess the last thing is, what's the rationale for, for not allowing an RV park next to another RV park without the spacing? And that seems to me to be similar uses. There are similar uses, but then you have an even more dense area around where other uses are not going to be that dense. So you're still bringing more traffic, more noise, more things to what would be Single family residents can only have 30,000 square feet. So the idea being you don't have continue to add density to density. You would space these densities out across the county so you didn't have those kind of interruptions and I guess nuisances to the existing neighbors. Is that the same rationale for an RV park next to a manufactured home park? Right, so we're still talking about densities because RV parks usually go down less than 30,000 square feet because they do some kind of community well or septic. So still concerned that the densities are attracting more traffic and things that would bother the people that live in the area. I'm just wondering if we'd want to encourage density where density exists rather than discouraging density where density exists. Does it encourage I guess that depends on if you're the neighbor that's having to deal with it. That's what the um, planning board was looking at. The neighbor that's in the single family home that's been there 20 years kind of thing. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. I know when I did the Sheriff's Citizens Academy, and I did my ride along with Josh Rottenberry. Um, I had the northern part of the county, like Union Ridge and all that. And he was telling me there's like over a hundred trailer parks in this county. Do you know the number, the count of that? And I have looked at mobile home parks over 25. I haven't looked at them under, under that. Now, if you include the cities in the county, yeah. we have well over a hundred. In the county, I think we were pushing them close to 40, 
with over that 20 some units i'm sure we'll be way over there if we counted anything smaller than that and if they've been here a long time do they have to rise up to all the regulations now or is that kind of grandfathered in Are, do they have to get all these bushes and all this landscaping and all this stuff no ma'am they continue to operate just the way they are where we would not write anywhere in the ordinance that they would have to come up to new standards only if you get a new mobile home park or if an existing mobile home park decides to expand into maybe future land that they didn't develop before those new rules would apply to them but we're not changing that manufactured home park section so a mobile home park can grow as long as it meets the existing ordinance only when you're getting to this rv park stuff is where you would have really new language okay thanks to the existing are exempt or if they uh, expand would it go back to the entire park or just the new portion um, as the ordinance is written now an expansion would be onto new land but maybe adjacent to an existing park only the new park would need to be uh, come under new ordinance but if they come in and take an existing park and try to redo cut the lots up things like that then it becomes all new again and it comes under new ordinance Just a thought, if we're expecting all these high standards, which we all need to live our lives with high standards, but if we're expecting all these high standards of all the new things that are coming in, but yet we don't have those same standards of what's been around for years and years and years, and if that long time ago park is kind of run down and has that stereotype that we're so afraid of having now, wouldn't it make sense if we just had that same standard that's expected across the county like you know spruce it up let's pretty it up let's clean it up because you know how i am about trash and um and hoarding and all kind of stuff like that because um we have a lot of hoarding situations and they're not with mobile homes they're with homes so i'm just curious about if we don't want the new to have the reputation of the old can we not raise up the old and kind of have better standards and expectations out of that if it's just not up to what it seems to be for this new I know that's probably ridiculous, but I'm just curious because all these different standards based on time is, is interesting. So we did start some language with that when we started this um, adventure with the manufactured home parts and RV parts. We did pull back and take that out after public comments and things from existing public home park owners. Um, for the RV section, we're giving so much more density that requires some landscaping and things we felt like kind of balanced the density versus um, other things that were asked of them. Okay, thank you. Prior to the public hearing, any other questions? Ms. Hook, I assume we're ready for the public hearing. Is that correct? Thank you. Do we have a motion? Motion to move into a public hearing when you've got the language. <laughs> <laughs> Second. Yeah. We have a motion to open the public hearing and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Now, public speakers on this side. Yes, sir. I get nervous when the public speaks, so <laughs> y'all like forgive me in advance. <laughs> we did find the last time. My name is Myron Pravat. I live at 2231 West Front Street. I also land, ha, own land out in the Swetsonville Saxpaw area. I have spoke with other Alamance County RV park developers and we all agree that these changes, we can develop RV parks that are appealing to the county for all while bringing more tax revenue to Alamance County. This tax is called accommodation tax. This is similar to a hotel tax. You also have the property tax based on the value of the RV park in the place of the tax value of, a farm, of farmland. Our customers will be overnighters, weekenders, and for rest and relaxation. Patients of UNC and Duke hospitals that when told they, leave, they can leave the hospital but need to stay for 30 days within an hour just in case there is an emergency. Traveling nurses that may have six months to a year contracts with UNC or Duke hospitals that prefer staying in their RV. Construction workers that may be working in the area for six to 12 months on a building project that prefers to their RV over a motel room. 
The Alamance County Planning Department and Planning Board have worked very hard to come up with an RV park campground building ordinance that would be fair and suitable for future RV park construction. We know it is important to get this right before it's approved by our county commissioners. The ordinance that, has, that was approved states as follows. No park may be located in any direction from a, mo a manufactured home park or RV park, community park shared by the community, school, church, or residence, except for the residence occupied by the owner of the park. On the other hand, you can build a community park, church, school, or residence next to a mobile home park or an RV park. <laughs> you can even build an RV park next to a subdivision. We ask that the ordinance be approved with only two changes. That the setback of 50 feet be changed to 30 feet and allow the buffer to be within this setback. We feel this is suitable for all adjacent landowners. The 30 foot buffer design that is in this ordinance will give neighbors sufficient privacy. We ask that the land spacing be eliminated. Land spacing. It is my understanding that the reason for land spacing is traffic and noise. You can build a restaurant, dollar store, convenience store next to a mobile home park or RV park and they will create more traffic and noise than an RV park does. You can build a subdivision next to a subdivision. You can build a church, school, community park or residence next to a mobile home park. You can even build a dollar store next to a church, school, community park or residence. As for the noise, I'm an avid RVer and every RV park I have ever stayed in has a 10 to 11 o'clock curfew that is strictly enforced. That means no music outside, you got to go inside, no noise, no sitting out drinking and talking. The curfew is a curfew. The ordinance for the Burlington City for RV parks states that the setback is 10 to 20 feet with a buffer. The city feels this is adequate for landowners adjoining properties. I'm not sure why we need 50 feet in the county. 30 feet should be adequate. It is my understanding that county commissioners can approve these changes without sending it back to the planning board and delaying it further. We are asking that the proposed ordinance be approved with these two changes. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. May I ask you a question? What about the um, single actual chassis and the 400 feet? Square feet? I think the 400 feet would need to go to at least five or five. I think that would cover everything. Uh, like I said earlier, some motor homes have three axles. I mean, they're heavy. And sure. they pull a little car behind them. They pull a little so car behind I'm, them. I would take out every stop sign in North Carolina if I yeah. had to turn. It would be bad. So are you requesting or suggesting that we eliminate the single chassis and the 400 square feet or less? Yes. And you're suggesting 500 feet or less? Well, I don't think it needs to be in there. Okay. I mean, if a manufacturer builds it, it should be allowed, as long as the park lot will accommodate it. I mean, the city has got 50, 1,500 square feet on their lot sizes. The county's asking for 2,400. Have no problem with that. They need to be bigger. You don't need, these uh, campers do not need to be on top of each other. No. But with that 2,400 feet and a 40 foot wide, that gives you quite a bit of depth. Now you were suggesting two changes 30 foot on the 30 foot setback from your property line in and, and then the less land spacing be eliminated and that includes i just don't understand the land spacing when you, you talk about noise um, it's bushes right no the land spacing is if I, personally i have a mobile home park on my property right next to me the mobile homes are 15 foot off my property line so i don't i just don't understand the land spacing you don't tell a subdivision they can't be within 150 feet of another subdivision. And I'm like you, Miss Thompson, that, you know, what are we doing? We're picking on people that live in mobile homes and, and have RVs? Do you recommend any other changes other than those? I think everything uh, else changes. is reasonable. No. I mean, they've worked hard to get what they've got. And I appreciate that, but I, just, <coughs> I feel like there needs to be these other changes to make it so that it's affordable to build an RV park and that you make it nice and for, you know, the people coming in and out. Any other questions of this individual? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on this side of the room? 
Anyone on this side of the room? Um, yeah, I, so yes, sir. Sir, I, you don't have to. I agree with Mr. Provide on, on about everything was said. It ain't no use, you know, repeating a lot. Your, your 150 feet was an issue, the thousand feet. State your name, please. Oh, my name's Philip Morgan. I live at 1300 Bonfire Drive, Mevin. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Bonfire. Yeah. Bonfire. Yeah. Um, the, the thousand. Am I, am I good? good? All right. The, the 150 feet, I think Mr. Prevett covered that. I don't want to take you a lot of time on that. Um, the 1,000 feet, same thing. It's going to be hard on hilly territory to get 1,000 feet because I got my property is, is a hill. There's a creek, and there's another hill, and there's a house over there. 1,000 feet, dang, you know, unless I build a wall, I don't know how many feet tall. It'd be 100 or so. It's going to be impossible. Um, and then that one's probably 500 to 750 feet away. Um, and they also have something in there to add to as far as the objections. And I, I was the one that met with um, the attorney in this uh, caudal on the, the meeting, um, screened from the road. It has on there, we gotta be screened from a private road, you can't see it, or a public road. That's gonna be tough. I agree with some screening decorations. I, you know, it needs to look nice. Our place gonna look nice. It ain't no other way of doing it but to say hey you got to screen it off from the public road completely it's a little harsh um and they also have in there and that's it's not a big issue but the road's supposed to be 26 feet of surface interstate highways the lanes are 12. so that's making us get a 13 foot or more lane and these are going to be five ten mile an hour roads so what do, what do they need to be wider for I mean, we're going to have wide skirts for them to get in. You know, if it's a 40-foot frontage, they can back in. They don't, they don't need the road front, the, the road width. Um, I, I didn't understand that that stood that one. I'm about like him, public speaking ain't my ain't my forte. Uh, I think that's in the 2,400 lots footage. That's a good size, but it's you're not getting the whole story. We got 2,400 feet of lot. Now, that's going to be where the people's going to be. Okay, septic rule says we're going to have another 3,000 square foot somewhere for the septic system because you have to have a certain footage for that because that 2,400, we ain't going to get the septic on that. That's their spot because if you figure it's 40 feet wide, 60 foot deep, the rigs are 40 to 70 foot long, that's the parking spot for them. So far as density goes, we have to allow another 3,000. I'm talking about RVs. We st we st and motorhomes. Yeah. Well, the motorhomes, the campers, you know, you, you figure if they got a 45 foot trailer and a big F 450 on it, yep. there you go. You know, it's, it's already 60. It's, it's, it takes that much space. So that 2,400 really ain't a true picture of density because then we have to go put infrastructure we got septic areas we have to put in to accommodate for that 2400 so and on rules it's going to take about 3,000 feet for the septic for that 2400 foot lot so it's got to be somewhere so now that lot's using 5400 to 6,000 feet which is okay that's what it takes but it's not a true picture yeah. of density as as it's was presented, it ain't like 2,400, 2,400, 2,400. No, it's more like 54, 5,500, 6,000. It's not here. You know, we got to set a tank and we might have to pump it over the hill here. It's, but the density is still not there. As You see what I'm saying, trying to say? It ain't saying 2,400 feet and that's all. Right. You got another 3,000 somewhere. Because it's going to take 3,000 to put that much septage at the ground. Um, and as far as the benefits of the county, it is the tax. And these folks are going to be bringing in services, you know, construction, medical expertise, accommodations for in-laws coming into town with the subdivisions coming in. There's people on in-laws visiting. There's just so many scenarios that, you know, we could come up with as far as being a 
plus for the county. Um, I saw my stammering. Y'all got any, any? Well, it's always positive to have a place to go when your in-laws come in town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somewhere else. <laughs> that was kind of the inverse, I think, of what he was thinking. <laughs> it's, it's a plus. <laughs> Y'all to strike that remark. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have in-laws. I can say that. <laughs> Uh, so you're recommending that the house set back a thousand feet not be a thousand feet. The the thousand foot screening from a residence or a church or a that's that's pretty much going down the vein. Now, do you want them or not? Because that's going to be a hard that's going to be a hard one to get through. It's with hilly territory, a thousand feet's a long ways. Mm -hmm. We'd point out that's under section E, page 123. Uh, actually, the setbacks are on 124. Um, what? Any other suggestions? Uh, well, it's basically a good rule. Um, the 150 feet <coughs> land space and the thousand feet screening on the front and the roads. That's that's my complaints along with what Mr. Prabhat had. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers on this side? Do we have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. A motion second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Guys and gals, um, Mr. Prabhat, named three setbacks which i think have a lot of merit uh, i think it's too restrictive and mr morgan particularly with the setbacks the thousand feet and so forth i think are uh, too restrictive as well we need an rv um, we, we need this but i i'm thinking we need to send it back to planning to clean it up and send it back to us uh, before we actually take a vote legal. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, so at this stage, uh, the Board of Commissioners, you either, uh, on your motion, you either move to approve, move to deny, or you can approve with modifications. So if you don't want to accept any of it, you could move to deny. All right. Could everyone hear that? She says we either need to approve or deny, or we can approve with modifications. Um, I think there's so many modifications, personally, that I'm just recommending we deny at this point, bring it back after the planning board meets. They meet the first Thursday of each month, um, so they will meet after our next June meeting, but we'd meet before our second meeting in June. Um, I'm recommending <coughs> we reject, let, give them a chance to clean it up. Um, and send it back to us in our second meeting in June. And I, I would also add there are three separate por portions that um, they've asked, like the manufactured home parts section, and then the RV section, and then in a section to definition. So just be clear on which, if it's all or parts of it that you're rejecting. Yeah. I would just make all that right. suggestion. Again, thinking out loud, and that's a dangerous thing for anybody to do, much less a lawyer. <laughs> Uh, the definition section I don't have a problem with. Uh, the mobile home portion I don't think I have a problem with, uh, but the uh, RV portion I do. Uh, I need input from the rest of this board. I agree. I do too. No, I think the RV needs to be changed. Sir? Yes. Please. Uh, dude, my attorney had one problem with the, RV, with the mobile home part with the, the non-conforming part. Um, they met with um, the county attorney here about the non-conforming part. All right, that, that, that's good. Uh, I'm, I'm going to change my motion to rejecting the entirety and ask the planning board to come back with us with it cleaned up. And after consultation with uh, the two witnesses that uh, I will ask, I can't tell the planning board what to do. But uh, I would request that those two speakers be able to present to the planning board at their next meeting, which will be the uh, first Thursday in June. Um, again, I can't make them do anything. 
but that would be my suggestion. Let's reject it today, give them a chance to clean it up as to all portions, and then bring it back to us before our second meeting in June. That's at least what I would request. I'm just curious, as long as this has been taken, has it put a hardship on you financially? Yes, ma'am. I've, I've, I've had quite a bit of attorney bills and just delaying construction of what what is it going to be. It's, okay. It's been, it's been dry. I can imagine. Yeah. What, what is the next planning board meeting? It June would be the, uh, yeah. June, no, June, June 2nd. 2nd would be the next hour meeting. Our, our meeting is the 6th. The first Thursday in June is the second. All right, so they will meet before. I, so we can put it back on for June the sixth. Thank you for the clarification. Yes, the planning board will meet June 9th. Oh, that's oh. the second, second Thursday. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, I would suggest that, that we could take this up at our next meeting after keeping it ourselves and looking at these changes ourselves uh, and come up with something that we could have at the next meeting, which would be a two-week delay, which I think address the concerns of, the, of those who want to get moving on something and it keeps it here at the planning at, at the commissioners i also by the way ha have some uh, some heartburn with the landscaping buffer discretion uh given to county government I, I think we need some kind of factors or something in there which says when we would make a decision regarding uh regarding buffers and screen fences etc or when we would not if we decide to keep it but uh, I just got a little heartburn there with the discretion without having some kind of factors or some method of making that decision. Yeah, I totally agree. And I'm just curious, are the, the buffers that are supposed to be going around your stuff anything like the dead Isaiah buffers that go around our solar park? <laughs> hmm? the solar energy park. They are real into buffers, but the solar energy parks I've seen, they're like dead bushes. They don't protect or visualize anybody's. Are you going to have live bushes? <laughs> Whenever we can get turned loose, we're going to have a nice place okay. that you're going to be proud of. That's all I can say. Well, I, mean, I just hear this all the time this. about buffers. A buffer to me is you got to walk through it because you can't see through it. That's a buffer. The buffers I've seen out at certain places I've read all over this county looking at these solar farms, and that must have been a previous description of a buffer. Maybe it's been upgraded. Some of them are right. Dead. Just asking. Mr. Chairman, the only problem I have with us making those decisions and trying to make these changes is the planning board, who's got more experience at this than we have, has been, I see Mr. Poe out here. How, many, how long have y'all been working on this one ordinance? Uh, on the RV, uh, we've been working on that oh, upwards four plus months. And at, at one point, we were meeting every week. And yes, a lot of these folks that have spoken here today has been present and have been speaking at our meetings prior to. What was the justification for the setbacks that we had in, in the proposed ordinance? Initially, uh, the planning board had a, um, a small group uh, get together and the uh, land spacing and setbacks were much larger. I know. When they brought it to the planning board as a whole, we pared it down uh, after many meetings much discussion that everybody thought that this was acceptable and approvable but we would not have recommended it to you. Ms. Connell, how does the planning department feel about the issues in the proposal that we're discussing tonight? Well, I think we're still leaning on this as an incredible density that we're not accustomed to in the county and can bring its own problems and then the problems become planning departments to deal with but without certain protections we wouldn't have anything to deal with and neighbors would complain and we'd be right back to what we put in the ordinance to try to protect similar to where we are with the heavy industry so we're trying to avoid that by putting and supporting the language that the planning board came up with to try to avoid any of those future issues that we're already dealing with Mr. Turner, was that a motion you made to continue this until? Does it need? I don't know if it needs a motion, but would you make a motion? I move that we table this to the next Cunningham Commissioners meeting. I'll second that. Okay. Board discussion. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. We've tabled this issue to our next meeting. I would encourage 
you two gentlemen and others that are concerned to talk to us county commissioners at this point because we're not sending it back to planning um, and or talk to Ms. Connell because she will talk to us as well. I certainly want to talk to both of you in the next time. I weeks. totally agree. Absolutely. Will you talk to me? Yes, yes sir. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, I was, I'll, I'll, I was under the impression since I had an attorney, y'all wouldn't uh, if talk you're, to me. If you're represented, we're required to talk to your lawyer. Yeah. Okay. So I just need to kind of channel. I just want to see where my venue needs to go. I mean, I'll, I'll can the attorney. <laughs> if that'll help. I definitely Yeah. Uh, technically, Mr. Carter is saying lawyers should talk to lawyers, and that technically is true. Okay. Um, legal, is Th there any problem with us talking directly to these individuals uh, or to their attorneys? Um, I th if they are represented by counsel, if you all are also represented by counsel, so right. if they have an attorney, then their attorney should talk to, to your counsel. But um, Certainly, you can accept comments and you can accept communications from the public. All right. Additionally, um, I'm not aware of any litigation in this matter. No litigation. Um, so that would make a difference as well. Um, contact our attorney first um, and follow her direction as to communication with us. But I'm hoping she'll say we can talk to you. Okay. Um, send you communications and I guess it's up to you if you respond I mean I'm I can't an attorney I mean I'm, I'm not trying to be wise I just communicating through is not as good as communicating to I agree and plus you got to pay for the lawyer they help you out yeah. so <laughs> once we're again both paid. So we're both paid oh, they're expensive so uh, I, that's I've why I just like, grand out so far. well if the lawyer says it's okay for me to talk to public people you guys are in the public so okay. leave your lawyer at home that's where I've been in the last couple months I mean I'm like there's yeah parties can communicate to each other you can communicate to each other directly excellent so meaning, Bill and I are eating a cheeseburger somewhere and he walks up you can say hi to us yeah okay and meaning we, meaning witness can talk to I'm, us I'm not allowed to talk to him without his attorney if he's represented because right. I'm an attorney. Gotcha. I think that's giving you a green light. That's the yes. way I'll read it. <laughs> Am I wrong? Unless there's some adverse reason or yeah. you know, unless it would prejudice you because of an adverse reason, then you know, as long as there's no conflict. Right. I think we're all trying to gain the same information and do what's right. Absolutely. So, okay, we're going to put this aside. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Are we ready for a proclamation? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. One of my favorite things to do <laughs> as I bring my glasses out. <laughs> Who do we have with EMS here? They, 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 they all went from the emergency. We're standing in the back of the car to work. Okay. So I watched them leave two at a time. They've got they out of call. here. Well, they got caught. Uh -huh. Ray, are you going to be here for this presentation? Yes, sir. Yes, Good. Sir. We saw the EMTs all leave. We have had a busy day. I'm getting smarter. I brought my glasses. <laughs> okay. Okay. Come on, guys. Okay, this is Emergency Medical Service or EMS Week. That's May the 15th through the 21st of 2022. We are here to attend all the county commissioners have previously signed. It's been attested already by the clerk. Uh, we're designating the week of May 15th to 21st, 2022 as Emergency Medical Services Week. Whereas Emergency Medical Services is a vital public service. And whereas members of the Emergency Medical Services teams are ready to provide life-saving care to those in need 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And whereas access to quality emergency care dramatically improves the survival and recovery rate of 
those who experience sudden illness or injury. And whereas emergency medical services have grown to fill a gap by providing important out-of-hospital care, including preventative medicine, follow-up care, access to telemedicine, and like that term. <laughs> and whereas the emergency medical services team consists of first responders, emergency medical technicians, paramedics, emergency medical dispatchers, firefighters, police officers, educators, administrators, pre-hospital nurses, emergency nurses, emergency physicians, trained members of the public, and other out-of-the-hospital medical care providers, and whereas the members of the emergency medical services teams, whether career or volunteer, engage in thousands of hours of specialized training and continuing education to en enhance their life-saving skills and whereas it is appropriate to recognize the value and the accomplishments of emergency medical services providers by designating Emergency Medical Services Week. Now, therefore, we, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners, in recognition of this event, do hereby proclaim the week of May 15 through 21, 2022 as Emergency Medical Services Week in Alamance County. With this EMS strong theme, EMS Week rising to the challenge. We encourage the community to observe this week with the appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activity dated this is 16th day of May, 2022 and signed by each and every one of us. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I, you're not getting away that quick. <laughs> <laughs> Let me add, uh, I and my personal family had an emergency Thursday night. Um, I called two people my second oldest daughter, who is an RN. At the same time, on another phone, I called 911. You guys were there, the firefighters got there first, and minutes later, I mean like two minutes later, the ambulance was there, and everything was resolved, and my family member is in good health at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. No picture songs? Where's I'm Thomas sorry. when you need it? Uh, you need to come back. I thought you were going to postpone that because of all the clauses. <laughs> Guys, you need to come back and tell us when you need to come back. Thomas. There's so many clauses. I thought you would be the scum of your attorney. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Thomas. <laughs> Thomas, you're all in game tonight. That was funny. Yeah. Sorry. Wait. Well, Steve, you know what they say? You know what they say? Even a blind squirrel finds a nut. So that's right. We <laughs> thank you. That was good. I thought he was going to punch me. I asked you, but she's a tiny little Just a change of the same. All right. Would you. Um, Someone catch uh, Ray and ask him to hang on just a minute, please. Oh, oh good. I need to talk to you after the meeting just for a minute. <laughs> Thank you. Has nothing to do with the presentation. Put those on the hours there, Ray. <laughs> okay. It's all yours. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, as everyone knows, I'm one of the county attorneys for Alamance County, and this next item is to uh, is to conduct a first reading of uh, proposed changes to the county's noise ordinance. Uh, these changes are introduced uh, for the purposes of cleaning up some language, clarifying some inconsistencies that are in the current version of the ordinance, and to, um, to just, just make it clear. And I'm going to go through all of the changes. The reason it's important to clarify ordinances is because vague ordinances can be construed against uh, 
the county and um, and restrictions that are imposed by government have to be reasonably calculated so it's another reason for some of these changes uh, so we're going to go through the first page and, and the other thing I want to add is that there's no action to be taken at this is a first reading because the noise ordinance imposes a criminal penalty the uh, law requires that you can't adopt an ordinance that imposes a criminal penalty upon the first introduction of the ordinance so this is just the first reading of it and there will not be action taken upon it until there's a second reading and, and then it, it can be adopted then if the commissioners decide to adopt it so if you go to the first page um, this is a really minor change it's the first section one you can see where it's redlined uh, it it read um, Alamance County ordinance prohibiting unreasonable loud disturbing and unnecessary noises the title of the ordinance is Alamance County ordinance prohibiting unreasonably loud disturbing and unnecessary noises so there's a quick edit there if you go to the next page oh and let me just kind of backtrack a little bit so what this ordinance does is it defines what loud and unreasonable noises are um, it, it establishes that uh, it's unlawful for persons or people to make or cause to be made any unreasonable, loud and disturbing, unnecessary noises. It defines unreasonably loud. Um, it sets forth factors to consider as to what is an unreasonably loud and disturbing noise. That's in section A. If you go to the next page, section 6, subsection B, if you could, uh, could you go back, Bruce? Yeah, B. That's good. Here you have specific acts that the ordinance determines are declared to be loud, disturbing, and unnecessary noises. And so there you have certain acts such as blowing uh, horns, um, radios in certain times, use of vehicles, whistles, exhaust discharge, compressed air devices, and then if you go to the next page. None of this section is being changed, by the way. This is just what it says now. If you, go to, if you keep scrolling down, okay, loudspeakers, amplifiers, you can see it goes through all these different categories of items that makes noise, and then further there's a, a clear definition of what noise. Okay, now stop there. Section 15. So among those that's declared to be loud and unreasonable noise is um, operations, and it says all operations at mining, quarrying, chemical manufacturing, asphalt plants, electricity generating facilities, landfills except inert debris and cement manufacturing. So the uh, proposal is to strike this language completely, and the reason for that is that this section is, is for categories um, like blowers, engines, appliances. It's not a section that sing is meant to single out specific industries. Um, the way it's written now, it prohibits, it doesn't give any regard as to noise level. And the purpose of this is to prevent unreasonably loud and disturbing noises, but that section right there doesn't really address that. It just prohibits all operations without regard to noise. So it's, this section as written would not be, um, it would not be one that we would wanna try to enforce the way it's written now, because that could raise constitutional issues for the county. So if you go, to section seven ex exceptions if you go down in here they specify it specified certain exemptions from the ordinance so for example you can see here farming operations noises from churches places of worship uh, noises from fireworks um, on holidays and then if you go to section 14 this section is it's proposed that this section be revised to just clarify and clean up this language, uh, make it clear that normal sounds, properly permitted industrial manufacturing operations are exempted within normal hours, and then it also provides um, a, what we propose is a reasonable limitation you know, on certain weekends to prohibit loud and disturbing and unnecessary noise. So it doesn't say you can't operate on those days, but it says loud and disturbing noises may constitute a violation so that would permit a sheriff to come out and consider whether or not that's a violation depending on the circumstances um, section eight under complaint procedure this is just a minor edit here they're correcting sheriff's department it's the sheriff's office so we're just correcting it to say office and then um, the other reason that the change in section that this change 
is important, I just want to point this out, is um, without these changes, you have inconsistencies in the statute. So if we didn't make any of these proposed changes, what you're left with is one section that says all operations at certain businesses uh, except Monday through Friday 7 to 5 are a violation of the ordinance without regard to level of noise or anything like that, just all operations. But then under Section 7, you sa it says normal sounds, according with an industry, are accepted from the, from the noise ordinance. So if you didn't make these changes, you've got two provisions that conflict with each other that are inconsistent, and, and that's the reason for these changes. That's why these changes are being recommended. May I ask you a question? Yes. Um, section 7.11, fireworks, says on holidays, you have a lot of times, uh, this is inside a municipality, Burlington City, and they have fireworks after ball games, uh, for example. Are we trying to prohibit that in the county? No. Um, well, this, this section, there's no changes suggested to this section. This section has existed for whenever the ordinance was enacted. I understand. My question is, should we make a, a modification there? If it's in the city limits, I don't see that that no, would city apply to the county. No, govern us anyway. Yes. I'm talking about in the county. For example, Cedar Rock Park is having um, a new balloon rally that will be um, September 9, 10, and 11. If they decide to have lawful fireworks, we've just prohibited that because that's not a technical holiday. Mm. These are the exceptions. These are the exceptions to the ordinance. So this is saying that lawful fireworks are exempted from the noise ordinance. Yeah. On holidays. Look at point 11. Noise from all lawful fireworks or noisemakers on holidays. Well, you know, this is one of those things that I think it, it would be dependent on the circumstances. I mean, if you have... Is your question asking, I just want to make sure I understand your question. I'm trying to ask, should we strike on holidays? I mean, we have people putting on, setting off fireworks on birthdays sometimes. Yep. Well, I mean, if it doesn't meet the exemption, then it goes back to the definitions of what's, of what's harmful noise. Correct. Does it, mean that, does it mean that it's prohibited? It Correct. Just means it goes back to it goes back the, the to definitions that exist prior to the exception. Yeah, Commissioner Turner right. is correct. Then you would go back and you would evaluate each circumstance under the facts that are there. So the sheriff's deputy would get a complaint. The sheriff's deputy would investigate the complaint, determine whether or not it violates the ordinance. He wouldn't be looking at it and saying, oh, well, it's not a holiday. You're automatically violating the ordinance. He would be, the sheriff's deputy would be looking at whether this is a loud and unreasonable noise, and he'd be looking at ver the factors defined under Section 6. Well, since he's sitting behind you, I think he's just took note of that. So. <laughs> Do you have a special noise officer that you call out for special noise SWAT teams that you have to go out and check? No, ma'am, we okay. don't. So you're not probably going to be asking us for a position for noise. Oh, okay, thank you. And I will I will share that we did we did get uh, share this with the sheriff's office, some of the officers in the sheriff's office, and they've looked at this as well. Well I saw the change from department to office, I assume that was correct. So <laughs> that our sheriff has been fighting that battle for years. I bet the health department could do that. <laughs> <laughs> So if the, if the commissioners would agree to put this on the next agenda for the next meeting, then that would be the second reading, and then at that time you would be voting whether or not to adopt it. And we thank you. Does that require a public hearing? Yes. Yes, oh. thank you, Commissioner Turner. So oh. but, uh, just a little note, state law does not require public hearings for noise ordinances, but this particular ordinance, the way it's written, does require a public hearing. The local ordinance requires a public hearing, so there would be a public hearing before this would be adopted. Thank you. Or rejected, either way. <laughs> Thank you. 8.3 is our county manager. Okay. 
Good evening, Commissioners. Um, before you, I have a request to approve designating funds from the general fund for the cost of two replacement ambulances at $400,000 and the cost to continue operating Family Justice Center in the event that their grant application is not renewed in June 2022. That amount is $258,908. Um, as you know, the Family Justice Center applied for a grant for renewal, and we will not know until later in June, um, probably after the budget is adopted, whether or not they are going to have that grant funding. So what I'd like to do is ask you to put the money aside in case their grant does not come through. Also, um, we were not able to get into this budget the two replacement ambulances, but I'm asking that you go ahead and set, a, set funds aside so that they can order those ambulances, which right now are taking 18 to 24 months to get in. Um, and these budgeted amounts would not be in the 22-23 budget ordinance. Any questions? And of course, if the grant is granted, then that money does not come out for that purpose. Exactly. But the replacement ambulances increase our total fleet of ambulances? These are replacements, so they would not increase the number. Is there any more life left in, that we can squeeze out of those that they would replace? <laughs> Two years. <laughs> no, especially looking down, like uh, Ms. Hook said, 18 months down the road, mm -hmm. the ones I replace them are going to be Yeah. Okay. And mm -hmm. the lead time is just so great. John, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. It's concerning the Family Justice Center. At our Jack meeting the other week, um, Sky was letting us know that last year, correct me, Sky, if I'm wrong, um, the Family Justice Center um, supplied $38,000 worth of emergency stays in motels because due to their sh no shelter. Mm -hmm. And I know um, the Family Justice Center, they got a big budget. I think it's what, seven positions? Six. Six positions. And I want to know the difference between the Family Justice Center and Family Abuse Center because I want to know if we are starting to compete, not intentionally, with some of the same things because there's an intake person. There's um, When I worked there, we had advocates who did the 50 Bs. It just seems like there's a, there's a lot of duplication in services, and I need, I need to know this because mm -hmm. um, there, there's just some questions because I know the Justice Center has carried a lot of weight. So. Can I come up there? Can she? Yeah. Absolutely. And I what she didn't have a clue who's going to ask this. <laughs> Forgive me, but it's just it, on paper. I just I just need to know the difference. I know there's a difference, but how much of a difference? And Sky, we all know who you are, but for the audience, please. Uh, so I'm know. Sky Sullivan. I'm the director of the Family Justice Center. Um, so Family Abuse Services is a nonprofit arm of the. They're the Victim service provider for domestic violence, uh, sexual, or excuse me, stalking and elder abuse, and then Crossroads does human trafficking, child advocacy center, and adult sexual assault. Um, both of those agencies provide direct victim services. So what Family Justice Center does is provide this infrastructure for the 11 partner agencies in the building. Um, prior to 2017, when we created the intake specialist position and the client services coordinator position, and I used to work at, I was at Family Abuse Services for five years prior to taking this role. We didn't have anyone to answer the phones, answer the doors, or triage anyone at the front door. So frequently we would get folks who were experiencing mental health crises, folks who were homeless, folks who were looking for custody, um, or folks who just end up in the wrong place where our partners, it was kind of a free for all, went up to the door, talked to a person, they could spend three hours helping them figure out where to go and they weren't actually victims. So Family Justice Center staff take on that triaging. Um, I would say, and I don't know the exact number, but maybe up to 30% of people who come to the door a year don't actually make it back to Family Abuse Services. We don't provide the victim accompaniment or advocacy. Uh -huh. So Family Abuse Services goes to court, they go to the hospital, they'll go to police stations, they'll help um, relocate folks out of county, whereas we spend about 15 minutes per client, they're spending on average like three to six hours per client. So we don't provide those services. 
I do have two direct service positions. One of those is a partnership with the sheriff's office. So we have a victim liaison who is embedded in their special victims unit. She is only at the Family Justice Center one day a week, at the sheriff's office four days a week. That is one of my positions, um, and we have we share an MOU and co-supervise that position. The other is out of our elder justice grant that we received for the first time in 2016. We were one of 10 um, counties in the nation to receive this grant, and it is ending September 30th of this year as well. Um, that one position is kind of a catch-all for our folks who don't qualify for adult protective services services um, or refuse adult protective services services. So if they have competency or then they don't want to elect for services, then we take on that caseload. And we have a lot less restrictions than an agency like DSS. So we have an elder, which in the grant world is, uh, or federal standards is 50 plus. We have a lot of folks in this community who are age 50 plus. So we handle those cases and then with the sheriff's office other than that the rest of the positions are um, more of helping the infrastructure of the family justice center now your navigators program are the ones that go to court to sit with that victim kind of like and that is a family abuse services program okay, now so, so fa family justice right? center will start programs and then gift them to the agency okay. So the lethality assessment program and the volunteer court navigator program are both run by family abuse services. Okay. That's good because on paper, it looks like you're two separate agencies kind of. We are. <laughs> but I mean, no, I mean that you're doing a lot of the same things as two separate agencies, but you just really right. cleared it up if you're passing that on to them. Because yeah. I knew with elder abuse, it's, just, it's abuse, it's horrible. The, okay. ma the main thing is that a lot of these agencies outside of counties that have that Counties that don't have family justice centers are very siloed. They don't communicate with each other and there is a lot of duplication. Okay. Um, what we do is we meet regularly with all 11 agencies to look at what resources we're putting in and to make sure nobody is doing the same thing. Okay. Thank you for clearing that yeah. up. Thank you. Thanks. Are there more, any other questions regarding this request? Do we need two separate votes? on this or can we, we can do, do it all one? in one vote all right mm -hmm. make a motion that we approve second any other comments all in favor signify by saying aye. aye aye any opposed it's unanimous thank you Um, the next item that you have in front of you is a request for the board to authorize um, the interim county manager to enter into a contract to provide janitorial services to Alamance County facilities. Um, we have, uh, what we're asking for is um, permission to enter into a three-year contract. Mm -hmm. This was put out to bid. There were six um, companies that bid on this. Alamance Cleaning Incorporated was the lowest responsive built, uh, bidder. We are looking at a contract that would go from July 1, 2020 to July 30, 2025, and it would also have uh, two additional 12-month extensions available. The dollar amount would be um, $27,801.34 per month. And there would be two contracts. One would be prepared um, for Alamance County government and the other for social services. But the total would still be the 27801. Did you say July 2020? 2022. I may have said 2020. 2022. Oh, are we going back? It's a three year contract. <laughs> oh, thank you. I may have said that. That's okay. And by the way, this contract would be, um, it is awarded, it would be awarded to our current contract holder. So we would be using our um, current janitorial services. Motion to approve. Thank you. Second. Have you had any complaints about, with our current provider? Um, when we have complaints, we we um, address those immediately. So we're not having like overarching complaints that happen over and over. So you're happy with the service? Yeah, they're happy with the service. Any other questions, comments? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> We're going to take a 10 minute recess. Thank you.
57 per cut. Um, it says snow removal, but snow removal is a different price, um, and that would be at $15,000. Mm -hmm. Is that the parking lot out here that you're doing? The so this lot? would be lots of parking lots, not yeah, just and one. Lots and lots of yards. Yeah. Lots yeah. Of and this, uh, yard. the mowing actually um, is for 24 locations. And we anticipate, or normally anticipate about 30 mowings a year. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. You anticipated my question. How many? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next request is to authorize the interim county manager to enter into a contract to provide vehicle maintenance services. Um, this contract would be with Wilson Tire and Automotive and it would be to service the vehicle fleet of about 422 vehicles. We did put this out to bid. Um, there were two responses, and Wilson Tire and Automotive was determined to be the lowest responsive bidder. bidder. This contract would be for July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2025, with two additional 12-month extensions available. Um, there's no dollar amount included in this contract. They did give us a list of services and the cost for those services. Um, we're spending about 225 annually on um, vehicle maintenance. And we would have two contracts, one for um, the county administrative vehicles and one for the sheriff's office vehicles. Well, we have two contracts for the Cleaning was it with the county offices and the mm -hmm. and DSS? And why is DSS not under a separate contract on this? So we do that separately because um, their their needs are a little bit different than everybody else because you've got health department in social in that DSS building or HSC building. So their contract, what's in it, is just a little bit different oh, than okay. would be the rest of the county buildings. And for this, it's my understanding that um, there are some requirements um, for funding that, that the sheriff's office needs their contract to be uh, separate. Okay. I think when they come in and look at their contracts, they're looking for their contract to be separate from the rest of the county's vehicle contract. Who services that group? Same. It, it's going to be Wilson Tire and Automotive. It will all of it will go to Wilson Tire and Automotive. We're just going to do it under two separate contracts. And they're, they're currently our contract provider. They Automotive. are our current contract Where are provider. They? Where are they? Mm -hmm. Two right locations. Over here. They have yes. one right, right, over here. right down the street here, mm -hmm. one over in Western, close to Western High School. I see Sheriff's cars when I'm going up on 87, see them up there sometimes getting some service and tire work or something. Yeah. I guess I have one question. Will these numbers be added to the budget or are they already in the budget? So when the uh, maintenance department, I'm sorry, when we did our budget, we already anticipated these numbers and I have gone back and asked if they changed after we got our bids. Um, that was done between um, budget retreat mm -hmm. and managers recommended and the numbers have not changed significantly. Excellent. Thank you or what we budgeted right. did not change significantly. That's always a good thing. Sheriff, are you happy with their services? Yes, sir. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you.
At this time, commissioners, I would like to um, present the manager's recommended budget. I would like to take a minute to say that this is definitely a team effort putting this together, and there were several people that um, really helped a lot. Um, the first would be Andrea Rollins, um, Mimi Clemens, Selena Campbell, who just got married, that's why I couldn't remember, and Susan Evans. So the budget team and the finance team were instrumental in helping, us put, helping me put this together. And I will say that questions will probably be diverted that way as we go through this. All right. So I'm, I'm going to jump right into this um, and just talk about recommended budget. So the recommended budget, the total budget is $241,307,393. Of that, it's comprised of a lot of things. There are several funds that make that up. General fund is the one that we talk the most about because that's the one that is going to include your property and sales tax. Emergency telephone is E911 funds. The county building reserves, those three um, for uh, county ABSS and ACC are your capital funds or in your capital plan. Fire districts, we collect those taxes and then redistribute them to the fire districts. Um, and then you've got tourism development, which is your occupancy tax. Landfill, which is an enterprise fund, so it is its own fund. You have employee insurance. Um, that fund is, your, um, is maintained for payment of um, employee insurance, and which would be your health insurance, vision, other insurances. And then you've got a workers' compensation fund. So we met um, on April 13th and 14th, and that was an opportunity for county departments to present to the board what they felt that they needed in the upcoming budget. In addition to that, ABSS and ACC were in those presentations, and then we have also collected uh, information from outside agencies. All of that put together, um, the requests were $212,547,512. The manager's recommended budget is 203 238 689 So what you'll see is that this budget is um, a reduction of 9308823 from what was requested and what you saw at budget retreat. This budget is built on a, a property tax rate of 66 cents. <coughs> the you next, would indicate that's the current rate. It is the current rate, yes. Um, so something happened to our slide where everything's not projecting up there. <laughs> um, so. If you click again, it means. Oh, sorry. No, it didn't help. Okay, so what I'm trying to show from this slide is the dark blue is um, property taxes. This is your revenues by category property taxes. The orange that you see up there is sales tax at 22.54%. So property tax and sales tax is about 75% of your revenues. Uh, intergovernmental is the gray section and that is 13.73%. That is your state and federal money that um, is get it sent to us to per, um, fund specific programs. So that would be human services programs, ICE falls in that, and some uh, grants. And then uh, sales and services, that is the yellow, and that is going to be 4.87%. Um, that is fees that are collected from our departments as they're servicing our citizens. And then there's one more that is I think it is the light blue, the other blue, that would be use of fund balance. So you will see in this recommended budget that there is a use of fund balance, and that is 2.5% of the budget. The next is just a um, summary of revenues and resources. And so you will see property tax, um, net of discounts and interest. Um, you've got a, a column, the first column says what was 2022 adopted, the next column says recommended, and then increase or decrease from that. So you'll see property tax net of discounts and interest. This budget is recommending that at uh, 106 
million seven hundred and eleven oh fifty one and sales tax we are recommending at forty five million eight thirteen four sixty nine and I will give you more information about those two other significant uh, pieces on here would be restricted intergovernor intergovernmental revenue and then um, uh, sales and service which is department fees and collections and you will see down at the bottom I am uh, asking for designated fund use of one uh, one million four hundred eighty four five ninety nine and undesignated or appropriated fund balance of three million three eighty three one forty one so again this is a total of two hundred and three million two thirty eight six eighty nine so let me talk a little bit about property tax. Um, so again, this budget is built on no property tax increase, so the property tax would remain um, at 66, 66 cents. The assessed values for property um, in 21-22 was 15,531 million. In 22-23, we are seeing an increase of that of $681 million. So this is a 4.39% uh, increase in, in uh, tax base that we are looking at. We're looking at collection rates around 97.5, uh, 98.7, and collection rates for motor vehicles at 100%. One cent equals 1.602, 686. And then our t uh, estimated total level um, total levy on property tax revenue, taking into account the collection rates, is going to be 105 million seven hundred seventy seven two eighty two forty eight. And then if we add to that um, prior year taxes that we are able to collect and interest and net of discounts, we're going to add an additional 933000 to that. So we're going to get to a budget of $106,711,051 for property tax. I want to take a minute to talk a little bit about property tax and remind the board that a portion of that property tax is committed. And um, 7.04 cents is committed to um, the capital plan. So of this, um, ABSS is getting 9039149 million, um, and that is 5.64 cents of the 407, I mean the 704. And ACC would get 2243760 that is 1.4 cents of that 7.04 that's above. In addition, there is a portion of the taxes that goes to debt. Um, debt set, step down for the county is 25 million, I mean, I'm sorry, 2.5 million. Um, that includes 2.4 in the capital plan and then 60,000, a little over 60,000, that is radio re, um, repayments from fire districts. And then ACC step down would be 2.9 million, and that the two total equal 3.4 cents based on our current tax, uh, current levy, and then our equipment plan, which we call the penny plan, is point actually 0.96 cents, and this year it would be 1 million 538 579. That capital plan is going to uh, cover debt service. It's going to cover an ambulance remount and then um, 13, I think it's 13 sheriff's vehicles. We'll talk about it more in, later in the presentation. And then vehicle and equipment purchases for other departments in the county. So now we go into sales tax uh, information. So sales tax revenue, we are projecting at $45,813,469. The way that we get to that is we are looking at projected revenues for this fiscal year. We have nine months of data that show us being well above where we were this time last year, and we are forecasting to end the year, this fiscal year, at 
So we took that number and we added, we increased it by four and a half percent to get to our new tax revenue, um, new tax revenue number. So just keep in mind as a reminder, some of this tax is unrestricted, which is the 19,728,547. dollars A piece of this is, un, uh, the half cent tax is 70% is unrestricted, 30% goes to school capital, and then Article 42 tax, a half a percent, 40% of that is unrestricted, 60% is restricted to school capital, and we did include in this this year um, 2.5 million Medicaid hold harmless. This, fund, this um, budget also includes uh, the use of fund balance. And what we are looking at is use of unassigned fund balance at $3.3 million. This is a little bit over what we used last year, so we're um, budgeting at 616,356 above last year's use of undesignated fund balance. And then we are asking to use fund, uh, designated fund balance as well. That would be 1.4 million. Um, and we're, this is a little bit of a reduction from last year's use of fund balance. And I think the slides may be out of order from what you've got in here, so I apologize. Um, designated fund balance, just as a reminder, we are at, we're asking for 1.484 million. And here is just a list of what that would cover. So you've got airport water, uh, airport sewer project, you've got SARA management, inspections, revenues that have um, been in savings, we're asking you to use that this year. And then reval um, savings that we had put aside for reval, we're asking to pull those and use those this year too. Um, and then pandemic response, when the increase to EMS was given a few months ago, we took $600,000 from ARP and we put it towards that. So we used uh, 300,000 in this current budget we're wanting to use 300,000 in the next budget. And then there are pandemic response funds that we would like to use of 743,502, and that'll give you a breakout of what areas or departments we feel may use these funds um, or may need these funds to offset COVID-related costs. There were some fee changes that were recommended in the budget from your departments. Um, that included health department, landfill, library, planning, inspections. Those are on page 20 in your in your recommended budget book. Did everybody get their yeah. budget book? Mm -hmm. Okay. So those those start on page 20 of that recommended budget book. And then there are some personnel recommendations. So these are recommendations for new positions. There are 13 of these. Um, the first would be an assistant county manager, an EM planner. So that EM planner, just to remind you guys, is a grant funded <coughs> position. And that is, a, um, that is a partnership between the health department and emergency management. There are three IT positions that are included in this budget network cybersecurity engineer, and basically that's managing our network security, a systems administrator for core systems, and a systems administrator for digital media. So core systems would be the systems that are core to county government, Microsoft, you've got emergency services systems, financial systems, it seems every department has a special system that they're using, so this would help with the administration of that. And then the other one, the digital media, is basically helping with things like virtual meetings, court media support, which has, we, during COVID, we really had to put, or IT really had to put a lot of um, support or efforts into, or resources into supporting the courts um, in getting them set up with um, their media and their virtual media. 
The other positions would be landfill, a CDL driver. Remember, landfill is an enterprise fund, so that would not come out of general fund. A paralegal for the legal department, park technician for parks, which would help with park maintenance, intelligence and electronic forensics analyst for the sheriff's office. This is going to help them with their um, investigations looking at electronic devices, getting information off of le electronic devices. Social, work, uh, social services, a social worker three, which would be for adult protective services tax data system specialist, and then a veteran services officer. In addition to those, there were some reclassification requests, and all of these requests are taking part-time positions to full-time. Um, elections, precinct coordinator, library assistant, uh, the first one, and then the library assistant two. And that last one on the list is actually um, combining two positions to make it one. So we would actually uh, eliminate two part-time positions and make one full-time position. And then the next piece that I want to talk about is employee compensation. And I think I expressed to the board that this was really my biggest priority because I feel that is the biggest need in the county right now. When we had our budget meetings, you heard departments talk over and over about their struggles with retention and recruitment. Um, so this plan um, recommends a compensation plan at $3.9 million. This would be $5,000 increase for full-time employees. Um, some part-time employees, those are, who are permanent part-time, so it's not going to be all of our part-time employees and it would exclude DSS detention and EMS out of the 5,000. The next bullet point you'll see, um, there would be no increase for DSS and FJC. They received a $5,000 increase several months ago, and so the 5,000 for everybody else is trying to bring some um, continuity to the rest of the positions in the county. A thousand dollar salary increase for detention workers. Those detention people res, uh, received a four thousand dollar increase in the middle of the year. So this is to uh, catch them up to the five thousand. And the salary increase for EMS was a nine percent increase. And looking at their salaries, I um, have have put in a two thousand dollar increase for those positions. Again, this is for full time permanent employees. This uh, compensation plan also includes a 2% merit program for county employees. This is a program that we have had for many years, and it is retaining that program. And then in implementing a shift stipend for um, Sheriff's Office patrol. And that would match the stipend that we gave to detention officers that were on the 12-hour shifts. Okay. <coughs> The next is employee compensation and benefits, um, retiree health contribution. This is from the insurance company, so we can't do much about this. Increasing 219,000. Workers comp increase 231,000. And then um, the last thing is mandatory increases from local government employee retirement system. The law enforcement is, and overall other employees each are increasing by 1%, and that equals 565941 We talked a little bit ago about the penny plan, which is the 0 .96, uh, 96 cents on property tax, and these are the um, things that will be purchased through the penny plan this year. The penny plan equals $1,538,579, and you'll see um, there's a truck for emergency management, lots of equipment for EMS, as well as an ambulance remount, a quick response vehicle, and um, that would be for EMS, and then a replacement vehicle for fire marshal's office, and parks gets a couple of things, a gator and a vehicle, 
and Sheriff gets 13 Dodge Durangos, social services, two vehicles, and then a few things for tax administration, which the most important one is the money counter, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I like to see that in action. Um, and then uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about landfill, even though they are not part of the general fund budget, but they do have some capital needs. And while we're talking about capital, I wanted to bring those in. Um, so I think what you're going to see up here is two pages. You've got it summarized in one page on your on your handout. So in equipment, they are um, their needs are seven hundred and ninety thousand dollars. That's going to cover all of the things that you see listed below. These are all things that they need at the landfill. The next on the bottom of the sheet that you've got is other improvements at $2.6 million. So this would be for a new scale house and access road. The landfill has talked about this for quite a while and um, really need to add this. That is $2.5 million fuel depot and automatic gate entry. So the total cost of these needs are $3,390,000. And they are gonna pay for that through the use of retained earnings, which would be their savings, 2.1 million, and current revenues, which is what they expect, revenues they expect in the upcoming year of 1.2 million. So I just wanted to point that out, even though that is not part of general fund. Debt service. So I wanted to talk just a minute about how much debt can the county cover and where are we at. So at the top, you'll see our legal debt margin is $1 billion. Um, that is based off of, is that billion? Yes, that is based off, that is the North Carolina limit and that is based of, uh, off of 8% of our tax base from our audit. And then what you've got is Alamance County's policy where we say that we do not want to be more than 3% of our tax base, which 3% is 486 million, 398, 814. As of July 1st, our outstanding principal is 171 million. So you'll see that we are way below both what the county has set as our limit and what the state says is our limit as far as how much debt we can have. So we are in very good shape as far as debt. And then below you'll see how much debt can we pay back. So Alamance County's annual debt payment, right? Uh, our policy is to be at 15% of general fund spending, which is 30,485,803. Right now, our debt service is at $20,976,455. So our policy says 15%. We are at 10.32%. So we look good on debt in both areas. We also have um, requests from the school system and the manager's recommended budget this slide is a little confusing, but I'll, I'll say this. Manager's recommended budget for operations is 46812319 Last year, operations, what was given to ABSS was 43248442 So this year's re manager's recommended is an increase of $3.5 million. For PAYGO, uh, that is maintaining the $3.3 million that we give them for capital. And then $800,000 is just, um, that is court fines that go to the county and get, come to the county, go straight to the school system of $800,000. So the total recommended is $50,912,319 for ABSS. This covers all of their anticipated increases in their current spending and gives them an additional 945,000 um, for expansion. The next slide you'll just see a history of uh, county funding for ABSS operations at the top and then at the bottom you will see for um, capital 
The green line represents debt service cost. The blue is reserves and the um, orange is um, CIP. So as you can see for ABSS, we're anticipating their reserves increasing and that has to do with tax, inc tax revenue increases. For the community college, the manager's recommended budget is 3.9 or 3,933,316. Um, Last year was five, uh, 3.5 million. This is an increase of 430,750. This is uh, for operations budget. For maintenance and repair per the capital plan, 388,000. For a total recommended of 4 million. 321516. And then this is just a graph of funding history for ABS, I mean for ACC, both in their operating funds and then in their capital. And what you will see for um, ACC is that um, their debt service um, has increased and then um, their uh, CIP, their PAYGO remains steady and their capital reserves, they have used a lot of their capital reserves um, for their projects. In addition to ABSS and ACC, there are a, a few other outside agencies. Um, Alamance Rescue Squad, this um, includes a $25,000 increase for them. They went from $100,000 to $125,000. ACTA, you will see a 77,000 increase uh, from general fund and an 18,000 increase from grant fund. The um, general fund increase um, was a request from ACTA and it was put in the budget because this is what they use as their match for grants and it will allow them to go after additional funding. TDA Arts and Culture, this is your occupancy tax. We are anticipating an increase of $411,000. And then your Home Care Community Block Grant, which is your elderly services agencies, that's an increase of $38,000. In talking about occupancy tax, um, so the total recommended is $1.3 million. The county, uh, the two-third, one-third county share is 457 million. TDA gets 888 million. 8,000, 8, I'm sorry, 1,000. It's going from millions to thousands, so thousands. So 457,000 and 888,000. You will see that um, there is one new um, recipient, and that would be Sort of Peace at 70,000. And then I have added a line which is tourism development. And this is money that is set aside that can be allocated at another time or can be used for other tourism activities as the board would like. Explain to those listening, <coughs> excuse me, about the occupancy tax, what it is and how we're required to spend it. Occupancy tax is what is collected from hotels and that is the tax that's collected from hotels and we are, um, we are required to spend it on um, what arts, tourism, tourism development. development. I couldn't think of the word. Thank okay. you. What is Sort of Peace doing? Are they hoping to get back into their full drama So stuff? Studio One has been going okay. down there and they are cleaning that up and that is their, that is their hope that that's they can great. open it back up. That was big when I was in high school. And then I just have a chart of general fund expenditures by function. What you will see is that the big blue one is education. That is 27.18% of our expenditures. So over a fourth of our um, a fourth of our general fund expenditures go to education. The orange is public safety at 23.96, so another fourth of our expenditures are for public safety. Human services... Let me explain again what public safety is. Public safety would be sheriff's office, EMS, CECOM, emergency management, fire marshal's office. Thank you. Okay. Human services is the gray, and that is 18.31%. 
just remember that that also includes grant funding, pass-through funding, so it does not mean that all of county funding goes to that. And then you've got um, general government at 11.96 and debt service at 10.32 percent. Fire departments, I said earlier, we collect those taxes and distribute them out. The budget for fire departments is $6,561,253, and you will see that there is one fire department that it, um, requested a tax increase going from um, one cent to 12 cents, so two cent increase. And then performance management, we still have performance management in place. Our department set goals. You said 1% too, you meant 10 cents to 12 cents. Did I say, I'm um, sorry. Thank you. Two, there's too many numbers yeah. in this presentation, <laughs> but I'm glad you're following me, there we go. Performance management, we are still um, doing performance management. At budget retreat, um, you were given information on our county department's performance management goals, and um, those also include workload measures, and our goals are tied to our pillars of our strategic plan, preserving agriculture, world-class education, smart growth and development, public health and safety, and government accountability and resource management. And uh, this report is posted on the county website. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about capital plan, but you guys have got that capital plan document. Um, and so I just want to talk about this so you'll know that it matches um, the manager's recommended budget. You've got five-year PAYGO CIP plan. Um, ABSS is on page 11 of your capital plan document. ACC on page 25. And county is on page 35. We have a list of unfunded projects for each of those areas, um, ABSS, ACC, and the county. And then we have information about the 2021 bond issuance for um, ABSS, ACC, and then there's an appendix in that document that talks about the timeline for, uh, for bonds. Also, you have Appendix F on page 90. That is going to show you our current Davenport financial model. This has been updated, and so what is in that book is our most current or most recent model. Again, this information can be found on the website. And what you'll see is ABSS is still on track with their timeline and their budget. ACC's timeline and debt issuance amount are changed a little bit because some of their projects ended up being a little bit more than they had anticipated and they had to back off of some of their other projects. And then as a reminder, there is um, a, plan debt, a plan for debt <coughs> issuance in October for ACC and this will get them the remainder of the money that was voted on from or allowed from our voters. As a summary, the total budget is 241307393 General fund budget is 203238689 And again, um, you'll see in your handout, this includes employee compensation, the $5,000 the $5, payment that we talked about, um, merit increases and stipends for um, sheriff's office. It includes county equipment, um, emergency and department vehicles and equipment. It includes the capital plan, education operations and outside agencies. The next steps would be for a budget public hearing on Monday, June 6th at 6.30, and that would be in this room. And then the budget could be adopted that night or on Monday, June 20th at 6.30, which would be our next meeting in this room. June 20th is going to be the last scheduled meeting before the July 1st deadline. So we would hope that it would be um, adopted by June 20th. 
And I might indicate that the next thing on our budget is moving um, the meeting, the first meeting in June, to the optional time of 6.30. We have not done that yet, but that will be the next thing on our agenda. How much are we saving from the reduced interest rate we got? Since we didn't take premium, the board mm -hmm. did not take any premium. What are the savings to the county from the reduction in the interest rate that we have on our bonds? Okay, so I'm going to turn this over to Andrea. <laughs> I'm not sure we have that exact number. Where you'll see that is in the Davenport forecast. What we have saved goes into the reserves. So the fact that we have uh, accumulated reserves for both ABSS and ACC, part of that is because of the savings from interest. But you can get us that number, right? We can get you that number. If it's any consolation, uh, Commissioner Carter, I got that number at around 2.89 million. I believe him. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a nice round number to me. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. I'd have to get the points. But yeah. Super good. Any other questions? But we're going to get hammered next time. Um, Watch the difference in September bond when we go to the bond market in September versus what we did in April. You'll get an idea where the bond market is in the past two years. It will enlighten you. And we are concerned about a decrease in sales tax revenue with the up and coming budget in the next year. So that's the reason we're where we are. Any other comments? Or is, any questions? Is, is this where we ask about something for a particular um, department in the county? Like, is, or is there a, this another meeting we ask about? This? You're welcome to ask now. Okay. Um, I was looking over the fine reading this weekend. These are not post its, these are a torn up envelope because I did not have any post its. But I noticed in the planning department that um, everything went up. Some things went up 10,000, some things went up 20, some things went up 50,000. Uh, I mean, across the board, what, what is with that? I got this on page 118. 118, you said? I think so, because I was looking at in other parts of it, it just showed it really itemized everything, and I mean, it just went up, and I was just curious as to what happened. I know we are tremendously building in this county. Do they not have enough employees? Um, what is what is going on? Do you have this as, I've got it as page 118. Page 118 is the inspections yeah. department. Inspections, okay. And on page 119, you'll see the changes. Well, actually, that's giving you um, personnel changes because of the COLA, because of the merit, okay. and because of the fringe benefit increases. And then we did have a 20% estimated uh, increase in liability insurance, which was visible in this department. And then of course their capital outlay went down because they're not asking for any capital outlay this year. Well, I know everything they listed, it, it was increased. I mean, like 10, 20. Because I wrote all in this book, all in this book. And I mean, um, I was just like, okay, here I am. Like on page 22, it's got um, <laughs> manager's license renewal, current $50, proposed $60. Um, everything just went up across the board. Is that just because it's the new budget year? So I mean, heavy industrial intent to construct permit, 500, 510. Next thing, 50 to 60. Next thing, 300 to 310. So, so the proposed fee increases yeah. were proposed by the department, and I apologize, Tanya's not here to... Well, that's okay. Me. I mean, it, it, the whole, every page, it's up. Yeah. I mean, it's just it's just up all the way across, and it's just, I mean, there's nothing that stays the same. A zero, even for a fire sprinkler plan, went to 60. And I, this may seem petty and seem little, but it really adds up when it's all the way across the county, because that's a person's going to be having to take that, they're going to have to pay that. And I'm just, you know. Well, in the annual budget ordinance, every fee for Elmets County is adopted by right. the board. Mm -hmm. And we tried to list what the proposed fee increases are mm -hmm. at the front section of this. Right. So if you do have questions, we can get the departments okay. uh, to explain. And, and the other thing was for the sheriff's department. Um, 
there was originally so many Durangos. There were three forensic positions, and then this SRO, um, like a leadership position. Captain. Yeah, Captain. thank you. Mm -hmm. And I had met with Sherry. I was the first commissioner to meet about the budget, and I had asked her if we could um, take those three forensic positions to keep those somehow and pull away from that SRO captain, which isn't in a school, just keeping children safe, and some of those Durangos. Mm -hmm. And I'd ask, and I, I got your permission to go sit down with the <laughs> sheriff and ask him, and, and it was a really good meeting because I know the sheriff has other funds that he could probably, you know, kind of even out for those cars because of the drug crisis in this county. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, getting the average Joe that's on the street using math is not going to stop. That's where your uh, diversion's coming in. But at the same time, if we don't kind of go outside our bubble and get rid of some of these drug dealers, then those three positions could really help that. I mean, we're at a real point where we're going to have to really go hard when it comes mm -hmm. to crime because crime costs us in everything across this, this giant book. It cost us lives. There were 10 overdoses last year and for 2021 and there's 17 just till now mm -hmm. and that's and um, there were almost 600 overdoses that were Narcan administered so we could have had a whole bunch of deaths because of fentanyl which is wide open at the bottom of this country and it's like I've said it's our new terrorist it's just taking out it's getting younger and younger we're seeing mm -hmm. 107,000 deaths in this country that's just we know of because of drugs and if we don't really get really hardcore about law enforcement and giving them the things that they need to go after this because um, working across the whole county with other law enforcement as well, we're all in the same business for Alamance County and that is to keep our public safe, to mm -hmm. educate our public and have great futures for our children. No matter what our zip code is, that's the whole point of everybody that's walking in this county. There's not anybody that lives on any street that shouldn't doubt their law enforcement or doubt their parks and recs or doubt their school. They need to all be up to mm -hmm. amazing standards. So I was just curious if um, if that's something that we can consider because I, I personally think we have got to go postal <laughs> when it comes to these drug dealers. Mm -hmm. And I when they ride up the interstate, I just want them to keep going off a cliff, to be honest. And um, so I didn't know. So, so what you've got in front of you is managers recommended. Right. The board can make any changes to this that you want to. I funded the um, cars yeah. through the penny plan. Gotcha. And so if the board chooses to take some of the money out of the penny plan to put towards new personnel, then they're, you know, definitely can do that. Just remember that new personnel is a continuing cost. Uh -huh. It's not a one-time cost. We did add one of the forensic analysts to the budget. So what you would be talking about would be the supervisor and an additional analyst. The supervisor is at 76, uh, well, after I add in benefits, salary and benefits would be 106, 147, and then an additional analyst would be 98,233. So I'm just pointing that out for the board. If that is something that the board decides to do, you're more than welcome to do. And we don't have to make those decisions tonight. Some of those decisions can be made um, at our next meeting um, before or after the public hearing. Well, I just hope that we'll really start thinking when it comes to our crime and how it's getting a hold of our children younger and younger and younger. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's busting up families, which is the very foundation of, of humanity, so mm -hmm. to speak. But if we got crime going about 80 miles an hour, and we want to get one more person to go about 65 miles an hour, we're never going to catch them. Mm -hmm. We need to go 85 miles an hour. And I'm just saying, we have got to be as tough as leaders, as as mm -hmm. the officers out on the street, because, um, I mean, this is National Law Enforcement Week, and we're going to have a memorial service for officers that lost their life. And we mm -hmm. just saw three or four deadly shootings just this weekend. And a guy that was a former police officer risked his life and lost his life mm -hmm. to make a difference in one of those. I don't, I can't say this when I was on the school board, I had more police when it comes to school shootings or school, whatever, it is not if, it is when. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna be on the news one day if we're just cruising, mm -hmm. trying to chase that rabbit, because that rabbit will never get caught. And I, as leaders, we got to start thinking like this 
not just voting. We've got to start thinking about what it's going to take to get our county not just safe but healthy because we got all these things we look at and all this stuff we want to do, but um, we got to start focusing on what's really healthy. Talk about parks and recreation, some of these ball fields, that's where your families come, that's where your community comes. I promise you, you have activities and stuff like that, kids are going to get focused and get into sports. I mean, I play sports all you probably did, I'm sure, and it was a big part of your life. We can really turn things around if we get into that mindset just to not tolerate this mess. I spoke at a D.A.R.E. Um, graduation this morning out at Pleasant Grove and talking to them about, you know, you've got to be that extra mile person. You've got to be willing to do whatever it takes to do whatever it takes. And, uh, and we commissioners have, we just can't be vote, voting bodies. We've got to really get serious about this. And, um, you know, I just, we just, whatever it takes for us to do this, to get a hold of this, because um, Starbucks is coming in where Shoney's was. So that's a homeless motel that's gone. There's Captain D's, that's the new one, and they're walking up the street to the Rite Aid. And I've seen it all over the place. I rode over there and took pictures. That's going to be a gas station. We have got a homelessness problem, and it's not going to go away by us just tearing down buildings. Because during the summer, that's, you're going to see more homeless on the streets. And this, we talk about mental health, and we're all about mental health. There's your mental health poster child when it comes to things that have gone on in the lives of these folks. They're not on the streets because they, when they were five years old, they said, man, when I grow up, I want to get high and get addicted to drugs and live under a bridge. I promise you that was not their goal when they were little. And um, it's just like the little boy. He didn't want to grow up to beat his wife. He was taught very well how to hurt somebody by an adult. So I just really want us to um, really just really grow something and really be strong and really mean business when it comes to taking care of the people in this county, not just numbers. Because in between all those numbers are lives. And we are losing lives to fentanyl and God knows what all. Every time you turn around, I work with it and I, I can honestly say I know what I'm talking about because I see it. And it's horrible. It's, it's just sin.com. The devil's having a field day with this kind of stuff. And um, if we can get up the street and down the river like I was ragging on Craig that night mm -hmm. instead of down here trying to get all the trash out, we got to look in the future when it comes to stuff like that and be willing to go for it. Because if we don't, we don't have a chance. Because it's not going to get better. It's not going to get better. Thank you. Okay, your next item is moving okay. the meeting. All right. I had one yeah. question, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Hook, the, uh, the sales tax increase of 4.5%, just wondering what the, the basis for that calculation is and uh, how, just how you came to that number. Okay. I do not remember where this is, but we will look page, to... Uh, page, page 8. Page 8. Okay. That's about half of the... Uh, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> About wait, Amber wait. Day. That is Dane Butler. That is Dr. <laughs> Dane Butler. Don't you even think you're leaving here. And that is our new superintendent. Yeah. And he is board, flipping amazing. The board chair said... Time to go. <laughs> <laughs> Great impression. Great first impression. Oh, he's going to be a good one. <laughs> we he's we be a good locked one. up. Busy. We got lucky. <laughs> okay, so for sales tax information, what you'll see is that for fiscal year 21-22, we are, we are trending a 9% increase over the previous year. So we're trending for our, our <coughs> revenues to be 43,940,639. Our increase, or we're trending right now at 9%. So when I went to, when we went to calculate revenues for the upcoming year, Initially, I calculated them at 9% and then got a little bit concerned, so we backed that down to 4.5%. So that's where we got the 45 million um, 813 number. I think it's doable. Because mm -hmm. uh, just, I'm just thinking out loud here. If you were to uh, go through the whole next year and only got $44 million, mm -hmm. we'd be a million and a half under mm -hmm. budget. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to have that. I think it's legit. And we have a lot of fund balance. If we, if that was to happen, we have a lot of fund balance. How much do we put into fund balance 
after the audit? 14, 14 and a half? 14, 14 and a half. So we're at 35 million fund balance right now. And at 4.5, we've got plenty of safety guards going. At 9%, we were at the margin, I think. Mm -hmm. if, if the board were to decide to lower the property rate by, by a cent, that'd be a $1.6 million reduction in revenue. It would be. Um, how, how would you how would you recommend dealing with that revenue loss? Um, I will say it's going to be very tough to take that out of operations and I really would not like to take it out of personnel. So I think that there's plenty of money in reserves for us to use utilize that if we if there was a desire to lower the tax rate by a penny. I think that's a really good idea. Just out of curiosity with inflation, I mean, I watch the news at night and we talk about how off the charts inflation mm -hmm. is. It costs 50 bucks to fill up my little Honda. Ooh. But uh, groceries, everything is higher. Mm -hmm. And all this looks like money from these sales taxes. Is it kind of real with all the prices are so jacked up? And, and they were talking about how a lot of folks are living on their credit cards. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you reach that limit, it goes decline. And, and that can be, that can go right to crime because mm -hmm. people are going to do anything. I mean, baby formula, just wait you start seeing that. That's absolutely the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. That, that is insane. And I, I just, just need to understand how, what if all of a sudden that just plummets? Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? Because we are really operating on our highs. I mean, we just right. got it coming in everywhere I look. But it can't stay that way. Right. House so, prices are yeah. just it's in, unbelievable. Little bitty houses are great big prices. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how this works or how it keeps working. Right. So our, our sales tax right now is trending a 9% mm -hmm. increase. And so you're right. It, does, it is going to slow down at some point, and that's why for the budget, we put it in at 4.5% increase. I don't think it's going to stop July 1. It's going to be a slow stop. So if we're at 9% now, we're probably going to be at 9% for a while, and then it'll slowly taper off. And that's why we put it at 4.5% uh, to be a little bit more conservative. I had it at 9% to start with, and then you start hearing all kinds of things and interest rate ch uh, changes. and so. We did drop it down to four and a half percent. I know we're very, we're tremendously blessed in this country to the point where we're spoiled almost. We just expect it to be there. And when I see, I would think, God, if I just had a baby, it would be a miracle. But if I just had a baby and I, where am I going to get this? Mm -hmm. I mean, because I've even heard really crude remark, well, just breastfeed your children. Can't everybody do that? And you need to have, be able to have a choice. Mm -hmm. It's okay, guys, don't flip. We're going to talk about, you know, no, this was, stuff. But, I mean, it just can't be putting, you just can't have those kind of things mm -hmm. that you say. But it's very concerning to me whenever something like that, I mean, this is America. And, I mean, we're not Venezuela. We're not we're not all these other countries, and we can't act like it. Not mm -hmm. yet. Not, thank you. You're exactly right, Bill. And I'm just, I just think we just, we just cannot think it's always going to be this rosy. Because nothing is, mm -hmm. ever. Well, I think uh, I think there are probably some triggers out there that could actually put the brakes on it instead of just you know, instead of just slowing down, coming up to a traffic stop. It could Absolutely. it could slam them on pretty hard. So uh, I'm sure leadership would really make a difference. <laughs> well, yes, a uh, whole well, different issue. And the anyway. thing to remember is that as we're going through the year, if we if it all of a sudden plummets and we weren't expecting it. We we can we can slow our spending down okay. as well. You've got you've got the the cushion of the fund balance. You've got the opportunity to uh, slim or slow down our our spending. We did not freeze positions this year. Well, except for three in one area <laughs> to help me balance the budget. But otherwise, we funded positions, and so you know. We can surely not all of those positions are going to be um, filled immediately. So there's ways that we can kind of slow things down on our end if we see that property tax isn't coming in like we thought it would. Well, I just know we've really pulled up some areas of county agencies that have always had people leaving mm -hmm. constantly. When DSS is in a crisis, our whole world is. 
and we're starting to see some people come back. I mean, that's all across law enforcement, mm -hmm. helping everybody, because we just can't not pay our people that run this county mm -hmm. so much less money than adjacent counties, because they will leave. It is not your hobby, it is your living. And we've seen the, the betterment of that happening when we've that, and um, I know there was a pay study years ago, and it just didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And um, if we really want to sound government to go with a great county, we have to have both. And we just can't play people's lines like that. I want to personally thank you and the rest of the administration and all the department heads, the sheriff's department, uh, and so forth, because there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of discussion with each department head, with all the administrators, in order to come up with this budget. Uh, and an awful lot of work. And just want to say thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Again, I want to say thank you to the finance and budget team because. They are the ones that um, are putting in the long, long, long hours to help us get here. And not to mention the meetings with morons like myself. <laughs> no one said that. No one said that. They all fought it, but no one did. Exactly. <laughs> can we move to 8.8? Yeah. <laughs> we can. <laughs> Um, the next item on the agenda is a request to approve a change in the meeting time of June 6th from a 9.30 a.m. meeting to a 6.30 uh, p.m. meeting so that we can have our budget public hearing and have as much of the public available as possible. So the location would be the same, the date would be the same, we would just be changing it from a morning meeting to an evening meeting. Motion and that would require a vote. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? It's unanimous. Four. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is just a um, an update and request from uh, Friendship Adult Day Services for funding for the agency. In talking to um, Connie, they are requesting an amount of $40,000 due to closing for COVID. They did open back up uh, Monday, May 2nd, and they have 18 clients that returned. They have several on a waiting list, and they're thinking that they can add an additional 25 people. So they did request a um, forty thousand dollars. Ten thousand of that was to repay a loan, and thirty of that was for continued operations and expenses until they can start get re start getting reimbursement from the state. Let me interrupt you there. Can we repay loans? No, you well, cannot. I was getting there. <laughs> that was my next statement. Was to say, Don't get um, yeah, the ten thousand dollars we would not be able to cover, and I've had that uh, conversation with Miss Morse. All right. So they're actually asking them for thirty thousand. So it would be for thirty thousand, and I asked um, the executive director to complete an application for financial funding. We got that application in sometime on Friday, um, and we asked that of anybody that's requesting more than five thousand dollars in funding. Doesn't state statute require that? I think Anything state over statute. five thousand. I think it. I would have to, excuse me, I'd have to look into that, uh, Mr. Chairman. We were provided by uh, Ms. Bechtel a uh, copy of the North Carolina General Statute that said anything over $5,000 uh, had to have an application and, and an audit. Okay. So uh, I'm just repeating. Okay. Your has boss. Uh, has <laughs> finance had an opportunity to? So to I don't know that our finance officer has. It came in to our budget manager, um, and I don't know if she had an opportunity to look at it. I think she glanced at it, but it's the finance officer that has to um, has to look okay. through that information. Do you not have to have a completed audit before you can tell us to approve or disapprove? Have you had time to review it? The is review it? process would be to review the information that was submitted for completion, mm -hmm. looking for um, a, at least a finance report. An audit is our internal policy. Mm -hmm. A finance report is the state policy. And we would be able to review that and, and give you a, a recommendation for whether it can be funded. Do you need time to do that? That has not That's been completed yet. 
I think that's what we probably need to do, give them time to. I'll make a motion that we just table it till the next time and give these ladies an opportunity to uh, review those documents. I'll second that motion. How long do you think something like that take? A couple of days, maybe a week? It should be done by Friday. Okay. So Friday that we have all of the information that's required. Sir. And if you do not have the information required, would you contact Ms. Morrison yes. follow Directly, up? Directly, yes. Any other discussion? All in favor of Mr. Lashley's motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Our one public speaker, finally. <laughs> I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to put some money in the budget to get rid of them two to ten plates. <laughs> well, I need to gain my weight back one. <laughs> well, you were warned. I told you to ask you if you brought your dinner or something. <laughs> yeah, I did it last time. Uh, got one request. I'm glad you like trash. I don't like to I know it. I'm glad you don't because I'm fixing to say something. All right, me and Mr. Hill, we done rode the roads over all the roads and got the signs. Come bring them to Mr. Walker up here in the morning and uh, set them signs. But I don't think it's going to do no good. But I talked to a lady. State your name. I'm sorry. Oh, James Walker. Okay, thank you. Talked to a lady that from Raleigh had your job, Mr. Paisley. <laughs> you know who it is. <laughs> she said y'all had the right to vote to uh, part, uh, pass a law on this TARP deal that's not working. And I'll tell you why it ain't working. Because they're going down 54 with the truck piled high up on the trash up to the cab of the truck with a strap on it. They're not putting the tarps on. That sign ain't worth two cents down there at the landfill. So y'all got the right to uh, write a ticket and vote on it. Y'all need to vote on it tonight and got the right for them to write a ticket, and Mr. Hill can write the ticket, and nothing else, Sheriff Johnson can collect the money. <laughs> <laughs> or somebody, can't you? Yes, <laughs> or somebody, and, and ever how much you want to charge. I suggested $45, Mr. Johnson should say 50 <laughs> or round it off. If it don't come in there with a tarp and it's not covered up, I'll come down 54 behind the truck the other day on 54. Bags flew off the bridge down there, and I called Hill as soon as I come down the road. Chairs laying down there now. Highway Patrol, I got behind him yet the other week. He drove right by a bag of trash. Didn't even stop and pick it up. Still laying down there. Who did? Uh, a highway patrolman. Wow. Nate, that was not a county deputy. And, <laughs> and still laying in the center of the road down there. At Worm Ranch Road and 54 intersection. Still laying there. Been laying there two weeks. Well, about a week ago, I told the sheriff I made my first traffic stop. <laughs> But anyway, y'all got the right to vote and charge them for not covering it up with a tarp when they come in the landfill. Unfortunately, I didn't have a ticket book. Yeah. <laughs> so, or a badge. And give them a ticket. He'll, he'll can write the ticket or whoever. And Mr. Johnson said he would put a car down there if we need to. So... I reckon that's what I'm asking. Need y'all to vote on that. May I ask legal to research that, see what we can and cannot legally do in your proposal, um, and then submit that to the county manager 
and then bring it back before us, please. She um, said y'all had the right to do that, and you had a lawyer here to draw up the papers and all. What I just asked. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Did the gentleman reference TARP Act? What was he referencing? What TARP, statute was it? TARP. TARP. Talking about a covering over the load. I'll be happy to look into it. Thank you. Thanks yeah, so the much. The truck I stopped didn't have one either, and stuff was flying out on the interstate. So. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's uncalled for. Yeah. And y'all got the right to vote. Well, that's what we're trying yeah. to do. And y'all got the right tonight to vote. No, we don't. No, we sir. can't. Not on our agenda. Well, that's what she said. Well, she was wrong. <laughs> She's just a little that's bit aggressive. That's what she told me. You were here earlier tonight when our attorney told us that on a, or when we were informed that on an, on an ordinance with a criminal violation or citation yeah. we have to have a public hearing and so we we no. haven't had a public hearing well, let's wait uh, and see what well, legal is required with a criminal um with this ordinance that has a criminal citation you have to have two readings before you can right. adopt it not not necessarily that not you have to have hearing. a public hearing yeah right. so i gotta come back and sit on the two to ten right. planks again <laughs> or, or i just hope you can count on us to do it <laughs> So we thank you. You can't vote tonight. No, can't vote tonight. Well, when can you vote? Would you repeat what you just said, please? I can't hear too good. Oh, um, <laughs> well, first, the, the, it, if the question is um, when can you vote on an ordinance that's going to in, invoke a civil penalty or implement a civil or criminal penalty, you would have to have two readings of that um, statute. So it, wouldn't, it can't be enacted in the same meeting. Well, we'd have to have a reading of the, of the ordinance and then a meeting after that. Correct. That would Correct. be the last meeting in June. Right. So we could vote. So I need to come back to the last meeting in June. Or you can come back any meeting. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, bring I'll, just, I'll bring you a cushion. I'll bring you a cushion. I'm going to bring a pillow. <laughs> <laughs> so I need to come back to the last meeting in June, and you will vote on it then, right? Depending we'll on what advice we're given, it's likely to happen. I won't guarantee anything until we get the legal opinion. Mr. Mr. Chair, the um, staff is will staff will be more than happy to reach out to him to tell him what meeting to come to when Excellent. this will be okay. discussed again or voted on. Excellent. We appreciate it. All right. Make sure you give her your telephone number. Right. We, Richard Hill has his number. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh yeah. Thanks. He got it. Excellent. And Mr. Johnson got it too. Mm -hmm. Everybody got it. So Mr. Walker, we appreciate you. Thanks, coming. sir. Well, yes. I just thought she told Amy, said y'all could the right to go ahead and vote and get it going. So. She has a, a different office now and doesn't control this board. So. Yeah. <laughs> She's just a bit aggressive. I mean, she did, she did probably didn't know it was two, two readings, and I didn't know either that it was two yeah. readings to get this <laughs> Okay. I'll be back in June. Then. We'll, we'll be Thank looking you, for you. Appreciate it. Uh, Anytime. Yeah, we'll be looking for you. Well, you might even make Put it some money in the budget to buy some beans. <laughs> <laughs> Should we take it out of the sheriff's budget or no? <laughs> no. <It's> yours. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Walker. Okay, commissioner's responses, if any. I just have a question. Sorry, Bill. Oh, you're um, fine. From what I understand, <clears throat> Connie Morris got another $10,000 donation. Is that correct? So my understanding is that she got the $10,000 mm -hmm. um, loan while she was here that uh, the one night that she was presenting, and then she got another $10,000 donation. Right. Uh, from uh, I think a couple at um, Twin Lakes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, when we meet again, because we table things all the time, mm -hmm. over and over, um, is she going to close? Is she going to have enough funding to stay open until we come back in here one more time about this? I don't have the answer to that. My okay. When did like when did that. she get her information? to the county to look at when it comes to evaluating um that was friday August afternoon time. okay this past or fr friday. friday around lunchtime yeah. okay mm -hmm. okay okay county manager's report i think i've said enough yeah. tonight <laughs> thank you i give you a big check mark thank you <laughs> definitely tomorrow's an election so everybody get out and vote it's 
it's like can't vote Wednesday we've had all these early voting days and tomorrow is the day so I encourage you to go and vote for those leaders in state, country, Mars, wherever, just go vote. Is Good that our county commissioner's comment? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Any other comments of commissioners? May I interrupt okay. for just one second? I signed up online to speak tonight. Yeah, she's uh, at the top. Was, was, what was your name? Deborah Shaner? Yeah, she's at the top. Yeah, she's at the top. There's not one on there. Oh, up here. I, it's oh, typed wow. in. That's why we didn't see it. Please come forward. I apologize. That's okay. Obviously, you know, if I stayed this long, I want to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, do, do you still approve of the benches? That was fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Debbie Shaner, and I live at 5430 Tom Road in <coughs> Methan. And that's off 54, Route 54 on the way to Chapel Hill. Um, I don't know, am I allowed to hand out a little packet of information sure. that I made up for each of you? The reason that I'm here tonight you. is because the packet of information includes just a few of the many studies of the effects of population growth in rural areas in North Carolina and water, which is one of our most precious natural resources. And once that's gone, well, um, so the one paper, the first thing in here is a uh, from July 2010 from the Environmental Protection Agency that says that, I'm just going to be very brief because you can read it then, it says experts predict that if present growth and water use trends continue, North Carolinians will find it increasingly difficult to satisfy their water needs in the coming decades. Um, I've also given you a GIS printout of where I live and the few properties surrounding it that have already been given offers to purchase by builders and developers. And just in this little area, on those eight tracts of land, there's 837 and a half acres that could be developed because there's no zoning and there's only a 30,000 um, square foot lot minimum currently. So what they're doing is the builders and developers are coming in and buying huge swaths of land, throwing as many houses as they can with that use well water and um, so they have no vested interest they don't care if the surrounding wells dry up or you know all of that and so not only that but they have I'm sorry I'm nervous <laughs> paved driveways so then all and of course chemically treated lawns that then seep in so what I really am here for is if you would look over that I would like to propose your consideration of a moratorium on the approval of large building development subdivisions and or and developments in the rural areas of our county that would use well water until such a time that there's a lot size restriction in place that would help preserve our groundwater systems as well as the natural beauty of Alamance County. What's the last part of what you said until the time of what? Until such time as there's a lot size restriction in place in rural areas that would be dependent on well water. Um, to help preserve both our groundwater systems and the natural beauty of Alamance County. Thank you. I would encourage you to talk to the planning board as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. They typically would look at something like this and bring it to us. Okay. Did she give you a copy of this? Sure. Uh, she did not. She actually was at the planning board meeting last oh, week. Nice. Yes, yes. So she has presented that information to you the planning have my board. You if you like. I've not seen those yet. Did you bring these? <laughs> I, I did bring these, and okay. you may keep these because I can print out others. Wonderful. There you go. Thank you. Thank you for coming and getting yes. involved. I wish every citizen in Elmets County would really mm -hmm. get involved because okay. that's it's the just concerning. You know, yeah. when you see them slap them up, and you're like. Um, yeah. Not good. That's like they drop them out of the sky. <laughs> Thank you so much for letting Thank me. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, County Attorney. Uh, yes, real briefly, uh, Mr. Chairman. So um, I'm I'm here to give a brief update. Uh, I know in the past I've been updating um, the commissioners about the status of the elements aggregates quarry and just to let you all know they are in compliance they cured the violations they've paid the penalties um, because they uh, submitted everything that they're required to under the ordinance we don't have any other choice but to you know approve the permit by law and so I wanted to give you that update um, and they did pay the penalty and they paid the penalty thank you what was the penalty 
$16,500. Sweet. Um, and then also I wanted to clarify a comment I was asked about earlier about speaking to whether you can speak to someone if they're represented and, and that. And just, just to kind of clarify, there might be some circumstances <coughs> where your legal counsel may advise you not to speak to someone who's represented, and that will just have to depend on the circumstances. So I just wanted to point that out for clarification. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're ready for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. <laughs>for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtv.com tvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.